The scene opens in a city where Lin, a young boy, is sitting on a bench. Although he appears to be a middle school student, his true age is a secret. He works as a streamer on a live broadcasting platform, presenting himself as a high school student to entertain a number of bored girls who frequently send him gifts in support. He has never introduced himself to any of them, and they would likely never believe the scene unfolding before him. The scene shatters all his beliefs when a purple beam of light descends, and as everyone else looks on in awe, a massive eye with numerous legs appears, announcing itself as Agatha Nicholas, the great ancient god. The people are terrified and speculate whether this is a 4D projection or something real. Lin feels as if the voice has erupted from nowhere in his mind. Agatha informs them that they should feel honored and excited, and requests their response to his summons to become his warriors and fight for him. A shield encases the people, preventing them from leaving. Agatha warns them not to attempt escape, as the protective membrane blocks any intrusion from the chaotic void, making escape impossible. Agatha grants them ten minutes to come to terms with their new reality. After ten minutes, he will return to assign their first quest, so they must be prepared. Lin feels as though he has stepped into a scene from a novel. He observes others frantically trying to contact their loved ones, but without any connection, they are unable to reach out. Lin wonders what is happening, reflecting on his youth and how he hasn't fully enjoyed life yet. He questions why he has been dragged into such a situation. Nearby, as Lin stands by the bench, a man, furious and desperate, throws the bench towards the sky in an attempt to break through the barrier. However, the bench falls back and lands on him. The onlookers are horrified by the man's condition and fear he might be dead. Terrified by the sight, they are reluctant to approach the edge again. Lin notes that such reckless behavior in this situation could indeed be fatal. With no signal and no way to leave, he ponders what to do next. As he checks his phone, he sees that he has received a gift from the distant future, and a wheel appears on the screen. The wheel displays various options like talent and lottery. Observing the reactions of others, Lin realizes that this wheel seems to be a unique feature on his phone. He wonders if this is some kind of cheat plugin. He taps the screen to spin it five times, collecting the rewards, and starts to believe that this really is his cheat plugin. Compared to earlier, he now feels surprisingly confident and less flustered. He decides to explore the features provided by the cheat plugin, beginning with the talent bars. He reads descriptions of talents like Trash Can and Master of Peeing and wonders about their purpose. Given their low rarity, it's understandable that they might seem somewhat useless, but he hopes the blue talents are more promising. As he examines the invigorated man talent, he finds it to be even less appealing than the white talents and fears that the gold and red ones might be equally disappointing. When he checks the highest rarity talent, which is labeled as NAB, he wonders what makes it special. Reflecting on his newfound confidence, he initially thought it was the cheat plugin that was boosting his self-assurance. However, it now seems that his confidence might actually stem from the red talent he acquired. The talent seems to help him eliminate fear and regain composure, which is impressive, but he wonders if that's all it does, or if he's overestimating the power of the cheat plugin. Next, he examines the epic talent of Kept Man. He reads the description and acknowledges that while many people dream of being supported by a wealthy woman, the talent feels a bit strange. Suddenly the talent begins to glow, causing Lin discomfort. He wonders why it feels so painful after reviewing all the talents. Despite this, he realizes he must endure the discomfort, as it's part of the cheat plug-in. His head still aches, and his vision feels odd. Unexpectedly, he starts seeing profiles of the people around him, and he notices that these game-like interfaces weren't present before. He sees his own profile, and understands that this is the real function of the game player talent. He decides to make the profile disappear, which it does, and he's relieved, as the constant presence of the interface could be irritating. He experiments with making it reappear and disappear a few times to become familiar with the function. He notices a woman and, upon reading her profile, finds it very practical. Initially, her profile shows her as neutral, but when she smiles at him, her profile updates to show her as friendly. He realizes that not only is the red game player talent affecting him, but the kept man talent is also having an effect. The lady approached Lin and asked if his parents were around. Although Lin looked young, he didn't expect to be mistaken for a lost child due to his youthful appearance. The lady remained alert and seemed uneasy, though she chose to care for him first, a gesture likely influenced by his kept man talent. She assured him that he need not worry, as she was not a bad person. Lin explained that he was an orphan, he thought that since this girl was kind-hearted and capable, and given that his cheat plugin didn't enhance his combat abilities, it would be best to get along with her. The girl was shocked to learn he was an orphan and apologized for her misunderstanding. 
Lin reassured her not to worry, as she was not the only one who had asked about his situation. He then inquired if they were trapped there. She guessed as much, confirming Agatha's declaration. She told him not to worry, as she was there to protect him. Lin thanked her, and, as she took his hand, she asked him his name and if he was in middle school. The MC introduced himself as Lin Hao and mentioned that she could call him Little Mouse, and he was actually in his first year of high school. Yun then noted that it seemed fate had brought them together, as her last name was also Lin. A man approached Yun, informing her that the current situation was still unclear and that there might be dangers. He advised her not to wander around as she might get into trouble. Yun responded confidently, saying she had the skills to stay safe. We then asked who Lin was. Yun whispered to Wei that Lin was an orphan and a high school freshman, and surviving in this environment would be challenging for him. She urged Wei to help Lin. We replied that they could barely protect themselves and questioned why she wanted to help Lin. Yun indicated that Lin was well-behaved and could be helpful if shown how to greet properly. Lin greeted Wei, and after some consideration, Wei agreed with Yun's suggestion. Lin thought that Yun really had a bodyguard and appeared to be not only tougher than he was, but also wealthy beautiful, and intelligent. He checked Wei's profile and noted that his attributes were all high, wondering if the profile was warning him about something. Then Agatha returned, announcing that most of them had already realized what was happening. However, since they all came from a world of absolute civilization and lacked experience in real combat, they could not yet be considered true warriors. Their first quest would be a trial through a dungeon instance. They would be randomly placed in various instances on the ground level to combat monsters. Wei noticed Lin's reaction and saw that he was utterly stunned. Lin thought the situation was outrageous. As he examined Agatha's profile, he wondered if the kept man talent even worked on ancient gods, which would be quite impressive. Agatha reassured them that he had no intention of allowing his beloved warriors to die in vain. While death in the instance wouldn't be real, the pain would be just as intense. He encouraged them all to fight bravely looking forward to their performance. With that, they were all summoned to their respective instances. As Lin opened his eyes, he found himself lying on the ground. Looking around, he noticed some people nearby and wondered why there were insects crawling around. One person complained about hating spiders. Lin thought that if Yun and her boyfriend weren't there, he would be in trouble. He speculated that their first instance might be a spider cave, and he questioned why everyone seemed so worried. Then Lin saw the large spiders and understood their fear. One man squeezed a spider and asked why everyone was panicking. He urged them to remain calm, pointing out that there were only a few spiders. He reminded them that humans, as apex predators, have evolved over hundreds of millions of years to reach the top of the food chain, so it was perplexing to fear a few insects. He asserted that with their greatest weapons, intelligence and unity, they could defeat even a hundred more spiders. Lin checked the profile of the man and thought he appeared to be the strongest in the group. Unfortunately, he was male, and Lin's talent wouldn't come into play here. Moreover, it wasn't easy to form connections with a man. A stone emerged from the ground, revealing the details of the first quest Spider Matriarch's lair. As Lin read the description, he realized that the cave's humidity was ideal for insects, and suspected that even larger and more dangerous creatures might be deeper inside. The others discussed whether to proceed together, with one person expressing concern about the crowd and the risk of someone getting left behind. Lin thought it would be best to enter in small teams to avoid making too much noise and to provide mutual assistance. However, given his young appearance, he doubted his suggestion would be convincing, and he wasn't sure they would listen to him. He decided to observe how things unfolded and noted that if the ancient god wasn't lying, charging in recklessly might actually be feasible, since they wouldn't die anyway. Then a voice, unmistakably Agatha's, echoed through the cave. He informed them that this was their first quest, granting them a special prompt. They were instructed to enter the cave, struggle through the night to survive, and venture deeper. If they lingered in one place for more than a minute, the spider matriarch would attack them directly. The group wondered if encountering the spider matriarch would spell disaster for them. A boy hesitated about whether to enter or not. The man replied that he didn't know but urged everyone to head inside, asserting that it was just a spider and they had weapons, so there was no need to fear the monster. Lin decided that since they wouldn't truly die here, he might as well go in and broaden his horizons. As they proceeded, most of them were frightened by the numerous spider webs around them. The boy noted that Agatha had mentioned there would be ten people in each group, yet there were only nine present. The brave man asked if the boy had overlooked the kid trailing behind, suggesting that the kid, who wouldn't be much help, should stay at the back. 
He argued that allowing a child to lead could be disastrous and that the kid was probably weaker than the women in the group. The boy pointed out that Lin was standing too far back and if the spider matriarch attacked, Lin would be the first to be eaten. The man questioned what was wrong, emphasizing that in life or death situations, they needed to use every trick in the book. He asked if the boy wanted to replace the kid with someone else to bring up the rear. The boy started to feel that the man's words made sense. As Lin was walking, a spider attacked the girl ahead of him, killing her, and blood splattered onto Lin. Lin wondered if she had met her end so soon. The others were shocked to see a spider attack and kill a girl. The man, sensing something was seriously wrong, urged everyone to split up and leave the area immediately. Lin was taken aback by this order, realizing that the man wasn't the leader, and splitting up now could lead to their deaths. Standing in front of the spider, Lin thought about how he couldn't afford to worry about others, and considered that he might be the first to face trouble. Running away wasn't an option. Exposing his back to the enemy was too risky. He picked up a stone and wondered if he could even harm the spider with it. He debated whether self-defense moves might be effective, but suspected that the sliding technique probably wouldn't work on spiders. Nonetheless, he needed to try something. He couldn't afford to die without putting up a fight. Just as he was about to attack, he discovered that the spider appeared friendly towards him. Lin wondered if it was due to the influence of the ancient god, or if his kept man talent was somehow affecting the spider. He was surprised that the red talent was proving to be so powerful and useful. As the spider came even closer, Lin pondered whether this talent had any special effect on the creature. Lin considered taking advantage of the spider's apparent friendliness to strike, but when he saw its face, he realized it was acting cute. Unable to bring himself to attack, he set the stone aside, struggling with his moral reluctance to do something unethical. The spider followed him, and Lin reflected on how it had become entirely friendly. It felt morally wrong to strike when it was unguarded, especially since he had developed a sense of empathy for the creature. After three minutes of observation, Lin gained a clearer understanding of the spider's strength. The spider was indeed much stronger than Lin in terms of speed and strength, though not vastly superior to humans. Reviewing its attributes, Lin noted that the spider was slightly weaker than Wei. The attribute panel revealed that the spider's strength was nearly double his own and its agility was triple. Even with a sneak attack, Lin doubted he could defeat it. The spider's strength surpassed that of ordinary humans, but it wasn't powerful enough to kill instantly. The girl had been killed quickly because the spider had been hostile and launched a surprise attack. Lin realized that the ancient god's arrangement was designed to test them. As warriors of the god, they would inevitably face situations where their hands would be stained with blood. Lastly, Lin reviewed the attributes, including strength, but he was curious about the mentality stat. He wondered why his own mentality was so high, speculating if it could be attributed to the invigorated man talent. He pondered whether a high mentality attribute might grant him superpowers, like telekinesis. However, when he tried to use his mind on the spider, he found that such powers did not manifest. Deciding to stop overthinking, Lin reassured himself that his kept man talent would keep him safe from the spiders, so he might as well explore the cave further. He hoped that someone might unleash their potential at a critical moment and clear out the spiders, which would give him a chance to get to know them. As he continued, he encountered two boys lying on the ground. It struck him that, as he ventured deeper, he had only come across the dead, not the living. It seemed that out of their original group of ten, only one or two might have survived. Lin had known that splitting up would lead to danger, and now it was evident. Moving further, Lin jumped down to find dead spiders and some remains of spider monsters. He came across a man's corpse and noted with a sense of grim respect that the man had managed to kill two spiders before dying. Looking back, Lin saw numerous spiders following him. He wondered if others might notice and be encouraged by his apparent lack of fear. The kept man talent was proving to be quite useful. As he marveled at the cave's vastness, he questioned if it was endless. Finally, Lin spotted a female spider sitting beside a treasure chest, with shimmering crystals adorning the walls around her. The lady spider stirred, grabbing her weapon as she awoke. Lin observed her profile and noted that she was also friendly toward him. He wondered if she was the ultimate boss on that panel, and whether the kept man talent was still in effect, ensuring she wouldn't attack him. The ancient god's mission only required him to delve deeper into the cave, not necessarily to defeat any monsters, so technically, he had already fulfilled the objective. Confused about the situation, Lin considered that the spiders might not be very intelligent, possibly leading him straight to the spider matriarch intentionally. He speculated if they were trying to set him up with her, realizing that they were probably hoping he would become their dad due to their familial connections. The spiders placed Lin in front of the spider matriarch. As she approached, he introduced himself, 
asking her to call him Little Mouse and inquiring about her own name. She simply touched his cheeks, and he felt a chill from her cold hands. Lin hoped she would at least say something, feeling frustrated that he couldn't use his silver tongue effectively if she remained silent. As he tried to speak again, she placed her hand on his chest and tore his shirt off, leaving him stunned. He protested, trying to explain that many paths lay ahead and that safety was crucial. He stressed that endangering herself would distress her family and that she should think carefully. Ignoring his protests, she covered his mouth with a spider net, rendering him speechless. She then bound his hands and legs with the same net, restricting his movement. Lin, feeling a mix of shock and dread, thought his years of innocence might be coming to an end. However, he was unprepared for what would happen next. To his surprise, the lady spider was not intending to harm him, but instead wanted to dress him in a garment made from her own spider silk. Despite his initial fear, Lin found himself relieved that the situation was less dire than he had imagined. He checked her description again, realizing that her greatest desire was simply to help someone change clothes. Grateful for the unexpected gift, Lin thanked her and offered to help clean up the room. The lady spider did not respond, instead pointing to a treasure box. Lin remarked that items left in a box for too long without being aired out could become moldy and that she seemed to have difficulty moving on her own. He offered to help her with the box, hoping to avoid any further complications. As he approached the box, he thought about its potential value, hoping it wouldn't let him down. Just as he touched it, the ancient god's voice echoed, expressing surprise that anyone could have made it this far without defeating any monsters and still receive a reward. Lin glanced around and noticed that the spider seemed to be sleeping and unresponsive, wondering if he was the only one who could hear the ancient god's voice. He questioned if such an achievement was truly remarkable, and if there would be a traditional reward for completing the mission perfectly. Agatha responded, indicating that achieving the highest level of reward was theoretically impossible. The box opened, revealing a blinding light that obscured Lin's view. He wondered if the ancient god had gifted him legendary golden gear. To his surprise, the box contained only a book. Agatha explained that it was a golden class exchange tome of epic quality, and instructed Lin to touch the book to receive detailed information and activate it through thought alone. Lin contemplated the situation, noting that the ancient god seemed to be offering a shortcut to gaining additional benefits as long as he exploited the rules. He accepted the tome, ready to explore its potential and see how it could aid him in his journey. As he touched the book, information began to flood his mind. He realized that the so-called class exchange tome could grant him a skill recorded within it. Choosing this skill was akin to selecting a class in an online game, but it offered him only one option, Monster Contract Master. As the name suggests, this class allowed him to enter into contracts with monsters and have them serve him. The ritual for establishing such a contract was straightforward. However, it required that his mentality surpass that of the monster, and the monster must not resist for the contract to be successful. He wondered about the origin of the ancient god mentioned in the book, the story behind the tome, and the origins of the class itself. Unfortunately, the book only introduced the skill of the class without providing any background information. The opportunity to gather more context was lost. Currently, he could only contract with one additional monster. To extend his abilities further, he needed to cultivate and become stronger. However, the book did not provide any guidance on how to cultivate, which left him frustrated. In battle, he could summon contracted monsters and control them with his mind to perform various actions. He wondered if this was like Pokemon, involving a group fight that felt particularly despicable, yet also seemed like justice, something that suited him perfectly. Although a true warrior should wield a giant sword and slash through everything, he preferred the feeling of hiding in the back and watching his contracted monsters tear apart opponents, with limbs flying everywhere. The book opened, and a screen appeared, asking if he wanted to exchange his class. He thought to himself that from now on, he wouldn't be just a mortal. He selected yes, and considered that he was now the type who hides behind his monsters. A symbol appeared on his hand, and he found that the method for using his class skill came to him intuitively, as if he already knew it. He realized that with a single thought, he could roughly determine the difficulty of contracting with the monsters before him. The spiders were minor creatures from the instance, their mentality much weaker than his, and they surrendered to his charm easily, which made the contract difficulty minimal. The lady spider approached him, shocked to see her humanoid form. He asked if she needed anything from him. She gestured, but he couldn't understand her intent. He noticed simple words written over her, which led him to question whether she was the instance boss and why the contract difficulty was still low. Her mentality was rated at six points, only two less than his. So theoretically, contracting her should have been much harder than the common spiders with only two points of mentality. 
Comparing his stats to hers, he noted that her level and attributes combined were much stronger than his. He wondered if the contract process was influenced by the class skill, and if this meant that in future contracts, he should target the matriarch monsters, those with slightly weaker mentality, but significantly higher strength. He told the ancient god that, since he was now a monster contract master, he wished to form a contract with the lady spider, and then remove her from the instance. Agatha was contemplating this, and Lin mentioned that he felt a bit sorry for the Lady Spider, who had been confined to a dark and depressing place to guard the instance. He recalled his own experiences of solitude and how he had grown accustomed to loneliness. Agatha assured him that his actions would not violate any rules. Lin was pleased to hear this and praised Agatha, saying she was the best. With that, he made his fingers glow and told the Lady Spider to begin the contract. A magic circle appeared beneath him, and he thought that since there was an opportunity to contract an instance boss, it was a chance not to be missed. After all, it wouldn't hurt if the next instance featured monsters of the opposite gender. He reassured the Lady Spider that from now on, she would no longer be alone. He anticipated that she would help him in battles and contribute to his growth, envisioning a bright future for them both. He observed that the contract was successful when the Lady Spider was absorbed into his shadow. Once the contract was made, the monster's body hid within his shadow, making it easy to summon her with a single thought. Agatha informed him that the instance boss had disappeared and that the instance would soon end, with everyone returning to the original area within a minute. Lin wondered if his contract with the instance boss had caused the instance to end early. Perhaps the ancient god's intent was to thoroughly explore the depths, and once that was accomplished, the instance concluded. He found this situation frustrating and lacked enough clues to form a solid judgment. Nevertheless, he noted that the Spider Matriarch's strength was rated at 13 points, more than double that of a Muay Thai expert, with agility three times greater. For now at least, no one should have an easier time completing the tasks than him. He could sense the Spider Matriarch's feelings, but she could not sense his thoughts, providing a one-way shield. Agatha announced that the instance was over and that teleportation had begun. As the people returned to their original locations, Agatha explained that the killing points of the monsters would be credited to their personal terminals. By simply thinking of their name, a blue light screen would appear in front of them. As a few people tried it, the screen indeed appeared. Agatha clarified that this was their personal terminal, which displayed information visible only to them, including their basic attributes, points, and task rankings. One man mentioned that he had earned 10 points and asked another person for their score. The second man replied that he had 11 points, which would be useful later. Lin looked around and noticed that he couldn't see the panels of anyone else. Agatha said they would have an hour to adapt or form teams to improve their chances of survival in the upcoming tasks. Lin decided to check his attributes and wondered why they seemed like a knockoff of his gameplayer skills. He questioned whether Agatha respected intellectual property. Just then, Yun approached and grabbed Lin's hand, asking about the instance he had entered. She was concerned about whether it was dangerous and if he had been hurt. As Lin began to respond, he heard the angry voice of the spider matriarch and wondered if she could still sense things in reality, even after being absorbed into the shadow. Theoretically, her favorability should not have dropped since she hadn't signed a contract with him. He questioned whether it was possible for any backlash or terrible consequences to occur and if he had mysteriously lost the ability to give commands. He freed his hand and reassured Yun that she should disregard what the ancient god said. He explained that the instance for the first mission was specially adjusted to prevent any casualties. Lin thought it was better not to anger the spider matriarch if there was no need to take risks. Yun responded that she was simply worried sick. Lin mentioned that the instance was indeed frightening, and if he hadn't been thinking about how much Yun needed his help, he might have been eliminated right from the start. He thought that having more friends meant more options, and since Yun was so friendly and capable, he couldn't just give up on her easily. Yun asked how many points he had acquired and revealed that she had earned 40 points. Lin replied that he hadn't checked yet, but when he did, he was shocked to see zero points. He wondered if he had received no points for completing the tasks, only for killing enemies, and found it unfair. The points interface even had a ranking system. He questioned whether this was a rule meant to encourage competition and grumbled about the competitive nature of this world. He mused about what kind of ancient god could be so greedy and capitalist. He told Yun that his points were zero and his rank was 30 50 first. Yun reassured him not to worry, explaining that he might have scored zero, but being ranked over 3,000 still placed him in the middle category, indicating that the ancient god recognized his efforts. Lin checked the list and saw that Yun was ranked 12 or 14th, while Wei was ranked 10th, which surprised him. Yun said she wouldn't discuss Wei further. Lin wondered if she had something else in mind, 
Yoon explained that she had come to find Lin because Wei not only achieved the 10th rank, but had also recruited many followers. In such a strange world, sticking together was essential for survival. She wanted Lin to join them, as Wei, being a skilled Muay Thai fighter, would make their group safer. Yoon grabbed his hand and urged him to join Wei and her, promising that he would be safe. Lin noted that while Wei's stats were only slightly higher than Yoon's, Wei had still accumulated so many points. Yoon mentioned that Wei had recruited several followers, suggesting he might have used some special tactics. Feeling frustrated, Lin considered that Yoon might not be able to save herself, and given how friendly she had always been towards him, he couldn't ignore the situation. He decided to go with her to check things out. Yoon led him to Wei, who was standing with three other boys. Wei addressed her as Miss and mentioned that it would be the last time he did so, stating that under the current circumstances, all previous identities and positions were irrelevant. In the instance, that well-dressed guy, who used to be a lawyer and was a high-class individual, ended up begging by his side like a dog. In that world, only strength was truly reliable. Yoon mentioned that she had noticed something was off about him during the instance. To earn more points for himself, he had driven old, weak women and children to lure spiders so he could kill more of them himself. Back then, Wei had said it was to perform better, and although Yoon disagreed, she had to accept his approach. Wei asked Yoon what exactly she wanted to do. He replied that he intended to use strength to gain more, and the three boys behind him were already prepared to follow him loyally. Wei then asked Yoon to become his ally. Under the ancient god, they would become the most capable subordinates, and with the skills demonstrated by the ancient god, they could surely gain benefits beyond their wildest dreams. She replied that she hadn't expected Wei to turn like that so suddenly. She wondered if men revealed their true nature once they were free from the constraints of rules. After all, they had been raised in a civilized society. Could they really embrace the brutal concept of survival of the fittest so easily after just a few hours? Lin took Yoon's hand and reassured her, saying it was unfortunate that a few people were so bad, but he promised he wouldn't turn out like that. He thought that Wei had become very arrogant and wasn't sure if Wei had always been like that and had hidden it well, or if Yoon had been too trusting. Wei checked Lin's points and found them to be zero. He sneered, calling Lin a loser who could only survive by leading women in society. He added that even in a civilized society, such vermin still clung to survival in a brutal world, and Lin had no value in that world. Yun told Wei that he was going too far. Wei responded that it wasn't too far, but rather the reality of the situation. He acknowledged that Yun's strength wasn't bad either, and with him, they could obtain better rewards. He criticized Yun for being soft-hearted and bringing along a useless boy who only caused problems in completing the mission. Yun replied that it had nothing to do with Wei. Since Wei had become so arrogant, they would have to go their separate ways from now on. As she was leaving, Wei asked her to wait. He told her that with her talent and the one she cared about, did she really think he would just let her go? Yun asked what Wei was planning to do, reminding him that fratricide should be forbidden by the ancient god's rules. Wei responded that, given her knowledge of his strength, he had managed to secure only the tenth rank among five thousand people, and there were many hidden dragons and crouching tigers. He suggested that if they combined their strengths, they could achieve even more. Yun told him to just dream about it. While his offer might sound appealing, if she became useless, she would only become his stepping stone. She refused to team up with him. Wei insisted that it wasn't for her to decide. Even if fratricide was forbidden in the city, it didn't mean he couldn't do it. And once it was a done deal, she would have to obey him anyway. Yun was angered and accused him of having no shame. She started running with Lin, urging him to escape since Wei had gone mad. Once they reached the main streets, Wei wouldn't dare to take action. Wei taunted her, saying that if she were running alone, she might actually make it. But with Lin, a useless person who wouldn't even be able to leave, it was a different story. He jumped and aimed a kick at them, but Yun and Lin managed to dodge it. Yun thought she could still escape but didn't want to leave Lin alone. Wei commented on Yun's soft-heartedness, noting that even in such a situation, she was still thinking of Lin. He wanted her to understand that in the current world, being soft-hearted was useless. He then instructed his boys to kill Lin. One of the boys mentioned that it was the main city and questioned if there would be punishment for killing. We asked what consequences there could be, arguing that the ancient god never said they couldn't kill anyone there. Besides, with Lin's zero points, Wei doubted the ancient god would bother to protect him. Lin, trying to act cute, asked if they were really going to attack him, and if it wasn't too cruel. He wondered if summoning the spider matriarch to deal with them would result in any punishment. The first boy said that a useless kid like Lin deserved to be taken out by them. The second boy agreed, saying that if Wei said so, they had to do it. 
The third boy suggested that someone like Lin would probably make a great scream of pain before he died. As Yoon moved towards Lin, Wei stopped her, telling her not to think she could get past him. He said she should watch how Lin would be tormented, and that this would make her understand what kind of world they were in. Lin thought that even if there were a punishment for killing, he couldn't just let them kill him and end up dying without a fight. He said that if that was the case, he wasn't stressed anymore. He then summoned the spider matriarch and told everyone to prepare to tremble in fear. One boy wondered if that was the spider monster from the instance. Another boy ran away, scared. The spider matriarch glowed ominously, instilling fear with her power. Lin remarked that it looked like there would be no punishment, and ordered the spider matriarch to get rid of the minions. He vowed not to let Wei slip through his fingers. Wei wondered what was going on. Why was there a spider monster, and had that spider really helped Lin kill people? With its structure combining human and spider features, its speed and strength were far beyond those of common spider monsters in the instance. He knew he stood no chance against her level of power. Wei fell to his knees, admitting he must have been blind not to recognize Lin's strength. He begged for mercy, asking Lin to show him some. Lin noted Wei's adaptability and recognized that he might be a formidable enemy. Wei tried to placate Lin, saying he wasn't a loser but a powerful individual. He begged Lin to disregard all he had said and let him go. Then Wei turned to Yun, referring to her as Miss. He reminisced about how he had been by her side for years, catching thieves and even carrying her bags. Yun responded by punching him, accusing him of daring to bring up such things. She said she must have been blind not to see that he was arrogant, insincere, lowly, and shameless. The thought of having once trusted Wei made her furious. After saying all this, she kicked him, sending him sprawling. Yun declared that true manhood was about standing tall and facing death bravely. She told Wei to look at himself and see if he measured up to that standard. She called him disgusting. Lin thought that Yun had demonstrated real skill by toppling the muscular man with a single kick. Her actions showed not only kindness, but also a strong attitude against evil. It seemed she was right, and having a partner like her in such a world was essential. Yun then apologized to Lin, saying it was her mistake in judging people that had led him into danger. Lin told her not to say such things. Yun mentioned that she had planned to help him escape, but it was no longer necessary. She then asked what Lin planned to do with Wei. Lin thought they couldn't keep someone so ambitious and adaptable. Wei begged to be let go, admitting that even without the spider matriarch, he couldn't compete with Lin. The spider matriarch advanced with her weapon, and Wei, now terrified, pleaded for her not to come closer. Yun wondered if Lin was planning to kill Wei. Although Wei had done too much, she had known him for a very long time. Yun decided to set aside her past trust in Wei. He had just shown murderous intent towards Lin, and she saw no reason to ask Lin to spare him. If anyone was to blame, it was the ancient god who seemed to turn every decent person into a devil. Lin noticed Wei's downcast expression and remarked that Wei had already been punished by Yun. Seeing how sincerely Wei was apologizing, Lin decided to move on. However, the spider matriarch continued to approach Wei. Lin wondered if the spider matriarch still intended to attack Wei. He told Wei not to harbor any killing intent towards him, explaining that he had made a contract with the spider matriarch by chance. She would attack anyone who wanted to harm Lin, and he couldn't control her. Wei dropped to his knees, insisting it was a misunderstanding and that he had no intention of killing Lin. Despite his pleas, the spider matriarch was poised to strike. Lin considered suggesting that Wei go back to rejoin his followers. Just then, Agatha intervened, stating that his warriors were not allowed to hurt each other within her space. Lin thought about how Agatha's friendly demeanor had been effective, given that she had allowed him to kill three before without stopping him. Wei, realizing the situation, claimed that since they were all warriors of the ancient god, there was no reason to fight among themselves. He swore to remain the most loyal servant of the ancient god. Lin saw an opportunity to test the limits of the ancient god's influence. The spider matriarch rushed to attack Wei, and Lin pretended to plead for her to stop, while actually hoping she would kill Wei. Agatha once again asked the spider matriarch to halt, but the matriarch didn't relent immediately, causing Wei to wet himself in fear. Wei was bewildered by how the spider matriarch could be so bold, despite the presence of the ancient god. We reported to Agatha that Lin had committed acts of violence against warriors of the ancient god, even killing three in a row. He requested that Agatha impose divine punishment on Lin. Lin felt relieved that the spider matriarch had only stopped short of attacking him, and it seemed that for now the situation remained under control, with no major problems expected. Tun thought that Lin's claim of not having full control over the spider might mean he could still be okay. Wei ordered Hanny to hold Lin accountable, arguing that even though Lin wasn't the direct murderer of those three lives, 
the despicable spider couldn't escape responsibility. Wei demanded that the ancient god eliminate the spider monster immediately, warning that otherwise he couldn't predict how many more people might be killed. He considered it a stroke of luck for Wei that without the spider's protection, Lin might face difficulties. Wei felt he had plenty of ways to deal with Lin later, just as long as no one else was killed in the process. Lin acted innocent, claiming ignorance of the rules and asserting that Wei had held a grudge against him all along, which was why the spider had acted. Agatha declared that from now on, the rule prohibiting warriors in space from harming each other would be strictly enforced. Wei was shocked and puzzled, questioning why the ancient god hadn't punished Lin and what kind of luck he had. He wondered if Lin had some sort of cheat. Lin reassured everyone that no one would be harmed further and instructed the spider to retreat into the shadows. He then informed Yun that they were safe now. Wei was frustrated and unable to accept the situation, as three of his minions were dead while Lin seemed to escape unscathed and could even continue to move freely with the spider. Wei felt this was unjust and told the ancient god that if such matters weren't addressed, it would undermine the control over the 5,000 warriors. Suddenly a lightning attack struck Wei. As he fell, Yun wondered if the ancient god had intervened. Lin found the situation both strange and unpleasant. He checked Wei's profile and saw that Wei was still alive. Agatha reminded everyone that the rule against harming fellow warriors in space was still in effect. Lin thought that while killing was prohibited there, it was permissible outside, so it wasn't a significant issue. Yun then asked Lin about the spider monster and whether he was controlling it. Lin replied that he didn't even know how it happened. It was indeed a stroke of luck that the spider recognized him as its master, but he hadn't wanted to kill anyone. He had intended to escape, but he couldn't leave Yun alone. Yun had been so kind to him, and he felt he must protect her at all costs. He just wanted the spider to come out and help. Yun grabbed his hand and reassured him not to be scared, insisting he hadn't done anything wrong. She said their deaths were their own fault, and that even the ancient god hadn't punished him. Lin agreed that they had brought their fate upon themselves. Yun realized that Lin had acted for her sake and had been forced to summon the spider. She felt that she had promised to protect him, but the situation had turned out this way. Lin hoped Yun wouldn't think he was dark-minded. Agatha declared that while the death penalty would be pardoned, the sins committed would remain inescapable, and those who had previously violated the rules would receive their punishment. Before Yun and Lin could fully grasp the situation, Lin suddenly disappeared. Yun expressed her disbelief at how things had unfolded and hoped that he would be safe. Li emerged from a portal, reflecting on how unpredictable the ancient god was. He had said they wouldn't pursue the matter, only to act suddenly and do so. The spider appeared, and Lin thought about being more cautious in the future. Although his body felt fine, he was puzzled by the situation. He coughed and told the spider that she had endured a lot, staying with him through all that time. He couldn't imagine what he would have done without her. The spider seemed pleased to hear this. Lin wondered where he was and where Yun had gone. When the spider heard Yun's name, she didn't seem comfortable. Lin then heard Agatha's voice announcing to the warriors that before introducing their first official mission, she had one more important thing to share, so they should pay close attention. Lin found himself among the other warriors. Agatha explained that they had all used the ancient god panel feature and discovered the existence of instance points. Instance points essentially evaluated their performance in each instance. The way points were calculated varied with each mission. For example, the newbie mission only counted the number of monsters they killed, and points were almost solely based on that. In the space, the concept of money no longer existed. To obtain anything, they had to pay with an equivalent amount of points, whether it was for common, essential, or unique and hard-to-find items. Everything could be redeemed with points. Observing that humans were social creatures who preferred and excelled at working together, Agatha had set up a system where points could be transferred between individuals, activated by thought confirmation. She hoped they would make good use of this feature. One man remarked that it was great they could stay together. Agatha continued, explaining that the building, including the shopping space she had set up, was their permanent headquarters. This place would serve as their residence, supply station, and starting point for each mission. During mission hours, no outside objects were allowed in the area. However, it was important to remember that potential dangers still existed. For their upcoming mission, they would be venturing into one of the myriad realms, an unknown world. The world, and indeed all the worlds they would encounter from now on, would be entirely different from anything they had seen before. This difference extended not only to the types of life present, but also to their strength, forms, and the fundamental laws that constituted the world. Agatha explained where they would begin their journey, and that they had two Earth months to delve deeper, 
gathering more information about the world. The phase points would be divided into exploration and hunting categories. After surviving for a certain period, everyone would also receive basic survival points. Those who failed to earn any exploration or hunting points within 48 hours would be eliminated. Some people were shocked by this announcement. Agatha continued, stating that in this world, there would be no such thing as coming back from the dead. All experiences there would be real and irreversible. She assured them that she wouldn't send her beloved warriors to their deaths without preparation, so she granted them three hours to rest and regroup. Once the time was up, the barrier outside would open, and the mission would officially begin. The group entered a building and discovered a portal. Agatha advised them to use the time to rest or enjoy their rare leisure moments. A boy wondered what useful items could be found in the gear section's spatial portal. A large, burly man mentioned he was familiar with the routine and wanted to exchange points for the primordial chaos and sky-opening hand grenade. Lin thought that it was the same old points mall system. Unfortunately, he had no points at all, which meant he couldn't exchange for anything. Unlike the spider's list, death was a real possibility in this world if they weren't careful, and without any points, he felt a lack of confidence. He noticed Wei sitting nearby, tending to his hand. Lin considered that he should keep a backup plan. If he ran out of points, he could always have someone else help him. As Wei got up to leave, the spider appeared again. Lin told Wei to relax, saying he just wanted to discuss what had happened. Wei insisted he wasn't nervous at all, though he admitted that the earlier situation had unsettled him. He recalled the ancient god's rule that Lin wouldn't harm him. Lin asked if that was really the case, then used the spider's web to pin Wei against the wall. Wei was shocked and asked what Lin was trying to do, suggesting they talk it out and negotiate. He thought that Lin had figured out his predicament. Despite not harming Wei, he could still be eliminated by the ancient god if trapped there. We propose that since he didn't have any other advantages at the moment except for a lot of points, and Lin happened to need points, he would contribute some as an apology. Lin replied that while that wasn't his original intention, Wei's suggestion was quite reasonable. He acknowledged that Wei had accurately guessed his needs. Lin proposed that Wei give all his points to him, suggesting that this would settle their previous issue. Wei was shocked by the request and wondered if Lin was really intending to rob him. He countered that he could give a maximum of five points as he needed to preserve his own life. He argued that if Lin took all his points, he might even resort to killing Lin, leaving no one with points to use. As the spider used her silk to measure Wei, Lin sensed that Wei was trying to act tough and suspected he might be bluffing. Lin told Wei that it wasn't that he didn't want to let Wei go. Rather, it was because the spider was interested in him. Not providing Lin with enough points meant he couldn't obtain the gear needed to manage the spider, which could lead to trouble for Wei. He asked if Wei had noticed that the spider was measuring him with her silk, preparing to turn him into a living doll. It was in the nature of spider monsters to transform their enemies into living puppets and control them as they pleased. Furthermore, the ancient god might not care about such transformations, as the puppets created by spider monsters were still alive, not dead. If not for Lin's intervention to suppress the spider, she would have acted immediately, and no one would have heard Wei's screams or pleas. Even if Lin wanted to help Wei, it would require a substantial amount of points. The spider monsters began weaving a dress from her silk, and Wei, terrified at the thought of wearing it, called out to Lin. He warned that if Lin took all his points, Wei would not survive either and would kill himself, meaning Lin would end up with nothing. Wei offered 80 points to Lin, but no more than that. Lin agreed to the 80 points. Wei was freed and, as he transferred the points, Lin was asked to confirm his choice. Lin selected yes, and the 80 points were transferred to him. Lin examined the items available for purchase, noting a wide array of medicinal supplies, armor, weapons, books, and potions for energy. He observed that people were scrambling over the cheap gear, which looked subpar, mostly white and blue quality items with limited utility. He wondered why there was such a rush for these seemingly insignificant items. With the ancient god offering unlimited gear exchanges, he questioned why anyone would spend their points on items whose usefulness was uncertain. Lin considered himself the wiser one. He had swapped out a watch for gear he might need during explorations, as long as he had enough points. It was like a temporary magic pocket, allowing up to five exchanges, which should be sufficient for one exploration. With the supply issue resolved, his next focus was on boosting his own strength. According to the section descriptions, he decided to start with the potion and tome sections. In the tome section, Lin noted that he had already obtained a class exchange tome earlier. He found that the tomes were divided into three categories, warrior, mage, and priest. However, his class, monster contract master, wasn't listed which led him to wonder if it might be a hidden class. 
the price for even the cheapest common white quality class exchange tome was over 200 points, which he considered quite steep. As he reviewed the descriptions of various items, Lin noticed a man's profile and thought that despite having many points, he couldn't possibly upgrade to level 1. This seemed illogical to him. Besides the skill books available in the store, he speculated that there must be other methods to enhance attributes, likely found in treasure chests from completing special tasks. His class skill involved controlling monsters weaker than himself through contracts, and the charmed man skill allowed him to charm individuals stronger than himself. He decided that he should primarily focus on improving his mental capabilities while avoiding enhancements to other attributes, in order to maintain a seemingly weak but highly strategic mental state. Lin decided to spend 20 points to exchange for a level 0 white quality mentality training technique. Although it was not of high quality, it provided a small boost that he needed. He could already feel its effects, faint as they were, and sensed that his mentality was indeed being trained. Some yoga-like poses came to mind, and he realized that actively meditating could enhance the training effect. Then Zheng approached Lin, presenting his business card. Lin discovered that Zheng was a real estate agent who had become involved in the game of the ancient gods, but was still clinging to his old job. Zheng explained that it was an old habit and clarified that he was there to invite Lin to join his team. He emphasized that working together would increase their chances of survival, as the ancient god had decreed that death on the mission was final. Lin was considering the advantages of teaming up, but Zheng's offer was interrupted by Lu. Lu arrived and asked Zheng to leave Lin alone, noting that Zheng should see that Lin wasn't interested in joining his team. Zheng stepped back and acknowledged Lu, expressing his willingness to withdraw if that was the case. Lin thought about how there was no established social order in this world, and that anyone could become an enemy based on interests or other reasons. Zheng left, but before doing so, he suggested that they might collaborate in the future. Lin thanked Lu for his help. Lu responded that it was no big deal. Lin wondered if Lu was the one who ranked fifth in points and checked Lu's profile. Lu introduced himself and inquired about Lin. Lin introduced himself as well and noted that his attributes were being evaluated by monsters. He realized that Lu had probably exchanged for multiple training skills at once, given that he was training three attributes simultaneously. Lin then asked Lu why Zheng had been targeting him, and if Zheng had been trying to cheat him out of his points. Lu explained that Zheng was selecting teammates, and Lin, having redeemed the temporary on-the-go shopping assistant, offered the best value for money compared to those who hadn't exchanged anything or had made random gear purchases. Despite Lin's youth, he showed considerable potential. Lu's team, which had more than 50 members, was the strongest in terms of overall strength, and Lu was seeking someone with leadership potential to help lead the team. He invited Lin to join if he was interested. Lin thought about how he had once relied on the strong because he was weak, but now with the spider lady, going solo and grinding points didn't seem worse than teaming up with weaklings. He thanked Lu for his offer but said he needed to discuss it with Yun first. Lu mentioned that Lin could have a spot as an officer in his team. Just then, Wei arrived and called Lu captain. He noted that Lin seemed promising but could also be quite arrogant and might not want to cooperate. Wei was concerned that if Lin joined their group, his own position in the team might be at risk. He wanted to discuss this with Lu. Lu remarked that Lin was young and inexperienced, always deferring to his sister, and questioned how Lin could have any independent thoughts. He added that if Lin didn't want to join, he wouldn't be forced. Lu suspected there was some friction between Lin and Wei. Wei acknowledged Lu's sharp observation, admitting there was a small misunderstanding, but assured Lu that if Lin agreed to join, Wei would bow down first. However, Wei worried that Lin might hold grudges once he gained power. Lu reassured Wei not to worry, suggesting that if Lin personally addressed the conflict, they could resolve it. Both Lin and Wei were important teammates, and Lu wanted to avoid any infighting. He emphasized that their attributes, next to his own, were among the best purchased by the team to quickly enhance their combat power. They needed to use their abilities effectively and contribute significantly to the mission. Wei added that the strong should protect the weak and the wealthy should help uplift the poor. As Lu received his sword and gloves, Lin thought about how being someone who had received focused resources from the team certainly accelerated strength enhancement compared to going solo. Lin reflected that he was only formidable due to his spider monster, and once Wei saved enough points to exchange for such amazing gear, he might bypass the spider monster to attack him directly. Lin anticipated that revenge would be sweet, even if it came after ten years. As Lin walked, he realized he hadn't given a name to the spider lady, and it felt odd calling her that. Since she always liked to chirp, he decided to call her Chirp. She appeared and hugged him, and he asked her not to get too excited, relieved that no one else was around. Up ahead, he saw Yun, 
She was happy to see Lin and asked why he was still there. He responded by asking why she was still around. Yoon explained that she had been waiting for him and apologized for the incident with Wei. She then asked him to give her his hand. Lin asked if she had something for him, and since he didn't need anything as an apology, Yoon clarified that it was a different gift, one from a sister to a brother. She gave him an amulet that could block one fatal injury, advising him to be cautious when exploring unknown territories. Lin recognized the amulet as something that required 40 points, wondering if Yoon had given up all her points. Yoon mentioned she still had some tasks to complete and reminded him to be careful. Lin wondered if she had lost her mind, reflecting on how rare such selfless people had become. As he got emotional, Chirp supported him. Lin expressed that such fools were becoming rarer by the day and that they should help Yoon whenever they had the chance, making her owe them a huge favor to ensure continued benefits. He then told Chirp it was time to get down to business. With the final 10 seconds left before the mission started, warriors were buzzing with excitement. Agatha's voice rang out, announcing that preparation time was over. As they entered the unexplored areas, they would disperse the fog of folly on the map and earn exploration points. They needed to delve into what the fog of folly was, and Agatha promised to award points fairly. He reminded them that while exploring, he would issue hunting tasks at any time, and completing those tasks would also earn them hunting points. He urged them to embark on their path of battle, struggle, and fight anything that stood in their way, as overcoming these challenges would make them stronger. As the path opened before them, the group rushed to enter. A man remarked that the person ahead had surely enhanced his attributes, making it tough to compete for exploration points, especially with the map in hand. Another man reassured him not to panic, explaining that while they couldn't compete with the top explorers, there were weaker groups behind them as well. They entered a dense forest, and some laughed at Lin, who was lagging behind. A boy told his companion that the unexplored area was vast, and those ahead were starting to spread out. They still had a chance to light up the map and earn exploration points. As the others moved ahead, Lin stopped and summoned Chirp. She appeared, lifted him, and he pointed out the direction. Chirp rushed off at incredible speed. The scene shifted to Lu's team, where a boy noticed something unusual on the map and wondered if there was a glitch in the display. Other teams were puzzled by the sudden line lighting up in the direction they were moving. One of them speculated that it wasn't a bug, but rather a path that had already been traveled before, and they hadn't received any prompts for exploration points. Lin and Chirp traveled that path, and as they rested in a tree, Lin noted that despite covering around 5 kilometers, they had only earned one exploration point. He had expected to earn more points, but it was just a small amount. He wondered if the safety zone near the base was too large, and whether the ancient god was hinting at the high strength of the monsters and the enormous scale of the map. It seemed that the mission would last a while, requiring them to focus not just on fighting monsters, but also on survival in the wild. As night fell, Lin reflected on their exploration, attributing their progress to Chirp's excellent mobility. Despite earning 10 exploration points, he hadn't encountered a single hunting mission. With 200 points needed to exchange for a level 0 breakthrough potion, relying solely on exploration to accumulate points seemed impractical. He spotted forest goblins and, upon checking their panel, saw they were indeed common, low-level fantasy monsters. They appeared to be slackers, which might as well have been an invitation to ambush them. These lower-level opponents had weak attributes and couldn't compare to Chirp. As a contract master who valued honor and strength, Lin refused to stop for an ambush. The screen in front of him indicated that he would be rewarded with extra points for an ambush. He told Chirp that, as the saying goes, even a lion uses all its might to catch a rabbit, so they couldn't waste the opportunity. Ambushing was a must. While the goblins were eating, Chirp attacked them, causing them to flee. Lin found the ambush successful and earned five points for each goblin killed. He instructed Chirp to continue killing them, believing that with just 17 more stealth attacks, they could exchange the points for a level-up potion. Chirp kept ambushing the goblins, and Lin was accumulating points. He heard the sound of more goblins arriving to confront Chirp. Although he suspected that the horn sound was a call for help, the reinforcements arrived quickly, some armed with weapons. Checking their attributes, Lin found that these goblins were stronger than the previous ones. He thought the prompt was annoying, but accurate. The stronger goblins could potentially pose a threat to Chirp. He needed to retreat, but if he descended from the tree, he would become a moving target. Allowing Chirp to carry him would make them both bigger targets, increasing their risk. He decided that Chirp should lead the goblins away while he found a safe spot to summon her back. The number of forest goblins attracted by the horn was uncertain, making the plan risky. 
Lin wondered if he had stirred up a hornet's nest of forest goblins and why so many specialized goblins, including skilled scouts, were appearing. He used the shopping assistant to recommend gear for a safe retreat. Two items were suggested, a hidden mist smoke pot and a one-time teleportation scroll. Lin noted that while the mist could be useful, Chirp could navigate through it using her spider silk sense, making the teleportation scroll a better choice for retreat. He purchased the scroll and activated it, instructing Chirp to hold on for another 10 seconds. Though the scroll's teleportation was random and unpredictable, it was invaluable in their current situation. With two points earned, Lin felt content. The teleportation began, and both Chirp and Lin were transported away from the area. Chirp hugged him from behind, and Lin realized that she had been teleported along with him. Her actions suggested she was trying to communicate something, and he understood that she had been automatically summoned back to his side due to the distance. Lin appreciated the convenience, as it saved him the effort of summoning her himself. It was always better to stay together, and a wise person knows when to avoid unnecessary losses. There was no shame in retreating if it was the smart choice. Fortunately, their retreat was timely. Chirp had only sustained superficial injuries, which did not affect her combat effectiveness. He told Chirp that while a man's revenge might take a long time, a spider's revenge could be swifter, and he already knew how to get back at their enemies. They decided to first check the map to see where they had been randomly teleported. Upon examining the map, Lin found it peculiar. The area where he had encountered the forest goblins was still shrouded in darkness. He wondered if there was additional time required to illuminate the map through exploration. When the ancient god had announced the rules, he mentioned that exploration points were awarded based on certain standards, but he hadn't specified what those standards were. It was possible that illuminating the map also depended on some unstated criteria. Lin mused that, true to the nature of an ancient god, there must be an unfathomable reasoning behind this. He pondered who would have thought that such a powerful being would be bound by unknown laws and tricks. He instructed Chirp to explore in the direction ahead. As they proceeded, Lin spotted a goblin camp with a watchtower. The main force of the forest goblins had been drawn out, leaving their defenses vulnerable. It seemed like the perfect opportunity to raid their lair. Lin, being kind-hearted, believed in not letting revenge wait overnight. The screen displayed a new mission, and Lin noted that it suited him perfectly. He had planned to spend some points on a significant move anyway, and now he could exact revenge and earn points simultaneously. He recalled that there had been hundreds of forest goblin soldiers previously, coming from different directions, and the current base did not appear large enough to accommodate so many goblins. Clearly, there were other bases. Lin had plenty of bombs with him and remarked that with their use, even the basic gear could prove useful. He told Chirp that her agility was unmatched and that she needed to fully utilize her speed advantage. He then explained the plan for setting fires using the firebombs they had. They threw the firebombs to burn down the goblin bases. The next day, Lin reported that he had burned down five goblin bases in one go, earning 30 points after subtracting the cost of the fire glue. This brought his total to 68 points. With a few more successful raids like that, he would be able to exchange the points for an upgrade potion the next day. However, their actions had angered the regular goblins, who might now be tracking Lin's trail, making the area off-limits for the time being. Lin noted that the areas of the map that had already been illuminated seemed to be free of forest goblins and were relatively safe. Since revenge had been served, it was time to lay low for a while. He reassured Chirp that their retreat was strategic. They could let the enemy chase them while they dodged, still completing missions and earning points elsewhere. Once they had saved enough points for some good gear, they would return to clean out the remaining goblins. Chirp seemed to be saying something when she suddenly turned back to look. Lin asked if Chirp had noticed something. Although he thought it should be a safe place, Chirp's reaction suggested she had spotted an enemy. As Lin and Chirp climbed a tree, he saw Lu with his team. Lin wondered why Chirp had reacted so strongly, and it turned out she had spotted Wei. Lin was surprised to see Wei, wondering if the old man had teamed up with others. Checking Wei's profile again, Lin realized that concentrating most of the points on a few individuals was indeed a powerful strategy. Even if they couldn't level up immediately, they could still accumulate equipment to nearly upgraded attributes. A goblin attacked Lu's team, and Wei instructed his team to watch him. He then drew his sword and slashed at the goblin, cutting it cleanly in half. Lin was shocked by the move. The combination of a level zero skill, special weapon gear, and enhanced attributes made that slash even faster than Chirp's. Lin knew Chirp wouldn't be pleased to hear that. Lin thought there was no need for a prompt. He already knew that people like Wei couldn't be left unchecked. Lu instructed his team to fully complete the exploration task to earn points as team resources, 
ensuring fair distribution after the exploration was over so everyone could benefit and become stronger. The others praised their captain's wisdom. Wei, however, believed that the warriors did not understand that fair distribution did not mean equal distribution. As a primary combatant, he would naturally receive more points. The truth was that the strong became stronger. After this mission, Wei planned to use 100 points to acquire monster-repelling weapon oil for his chain blade. With his skilled flying blade slash, he could easily take down Lin's spider monsters. As for Lin, Wei intended to deal with him slowly and meticulously, and he would handle Chirp later. Just then, Chirp arrived and decapitated Wei. Lu saw this and warned his team to be on alert. They wondered if it was a spider monster that had already killed Wei. The sight of it frightened them all. Besides the goblins, were there such powerful monsters in the wild? Lu was shocked and pondered how, despite Wei's enhancements, he was no match for the spider monster. He wondered what would have happened if it had been him facing it. He decided to avoid glancing in that direction. Chirp disappeared, and Lu declared that no matter what the monster was or where it came from, it had killed his teammates, and Lu would never ally with it. The others were relieved, thinking that Lu scared the spider monster away, and they felt safe as long as Lu was there. Lu, however, felt it was a miracle that the monster had left on its own. He nearly collapsed from exhaustion and wondered where the spider monster had come from. The whole team was frightened, and Lu hoped that a pep talk could boost everyone's morale. On the third day, a boy and a girl were being pursued by a goblin. The girl complained about how fast the monster was and how their weapons couldn't hit it. She wondered how they would get rid of it. The boy replied that he knew what to do. He aimed the crossbow at her leg, intending to shoot and make her fall. He mentioned that by using her as bait, the monster would no longer chase after him. She retorted, saying that he had relied on her family to secure his household registration, and questioned how he could act so callously towards her. Jang told her to be quiet, asserting that her family knew he was poor and had demanded a huge dowry. He had wanted to leave her for a long time, and now he needed to survive and break free from the constraints of reality once and for all. He was determined to stand out in this strange world. Just then, another goblin attacked Jang. After the goblin was dealt with, a few more were killed as well. Lin was examining the map and noted that the previously well-explored areas were now dark because the forest goblin army had invaded and taken over. Following the ancient god's mission instructions, Lin realized that the tasks arranged by the ancient god were not child's play. The worst-case scenario was that if they couldn't stop the forest goblin army from advancing, most people would be trapped in the safe zone and die after 48 hours due to a lack of points. Someone like Lin, a strong lone wolf, could only engage in guerrilla warfare against the massive forest goblin forces, squeezing through gaps to complete missions and earn enough points to survive. Then Chirp showed him a goblin corpse. Lin thought about the riddle that the prompt had posed and wondered about the great terror it implied. The ominous red hair on the corpse suggested old age, and despite his experience in countless battles, Lin didn't think it could fool him. As Chirp seemed about to bite the corpse, Lin asked her to wait, insisting that she shouldn't eat it. Lin thought that he wasn't intimidated by the supposed great terror. It was all just psychological. After forming a contract with Chirp, he didn't need to eat as long as he provided her with magic power. Thus, surviving in the wild only required him to feed himself. He had hoped to find wild animals or fruits in the forest, but it was overrun with goblins. Having already finished the bread he brought with him, Lin contacted the shopping assistant for suggestions on wilderness survival food. The assistant suggested dragon liver and other expensive items, but Lin asked to narrow the options down to something under five points, as the more affordable choices would be better for his budget. He ended up purchasing a few items, realizing that saving up 30 points for around two months of survival food was challenging. He was eager to advance to the next stage, and recalled that he still had one seemingly useless skill. Nearby, other boys were eating their rations. One boy complained about the pill costing five points, which he had spent all his points on after finally earning some. The second boy added that the pills made him nauseous, and if the food didn't spoil so quickly, he would be reluctant to spend points on such items for an outing. They then looked at Lin, questioning why he was eating grass and whether he had no points to exchange for better food. Lin, eating the grass, thought that his seemingly useless skill could actually be quite handy. Surprisingly, he found the grass delicious and was able to digest it easily. He continued eating a lot of grass, which annoyed the first boy who commented on Lin's enjoyment of tree bark and grass roots. The second boy wondered what it took to complete such a peculiar task. Meanwhile, Lin and Chirp were capturing goblins and increasing their points. He felt that his vigilance and monitoring of the goblins' movements had paid off, as he found the perfect moment to set up an ambush. 
he instructed Chirp to lay spiderweb traps to restrict the movements of the forest goblin group. Lin noted that the regular forest goblin soldiers were quite formidable, displaying excellent coordination in battle. It took Chirp considerable effort to defeat them, and even then, she sustained some injuries. As she approached him, injured, he reassured her that these minor wounds were inconsequential and tasked her with cleaning up the battlefield. Reviewing Chirp's profile, Lin realized that, even at level 1, it was challenging for her to dominate and maintain an advantage. He identified two options, either attract more monsters as helpers or enhance her strength. It was also uncertain which class skills would be unlocked upon leveling up. Lin had managed to save up to 300 points, but his mental attributes still hadn't reached their full potential. He believed the meditation he'd been practicing in his free time was paying off, as his mentality had now reached its limits and he was ready to use the upgrade potion. With only three purchase quotas left in the mobile store, it would be wasteful to use them all at once. Despite the upcoming five-day journey, Chirp could carry him back in half a day, so he decided it was time to level up. Chirp was being happy to carry him. At the store, Lin noted that, since it was a quiet time with no other customers around, Chirp didn't need to be concealed. He exchanged 200 points for a level zero upgrade potion, ensuring that every drop of the essence was used efficiently. After drinking it in one gulp, he immediately felt a peculiar change. His thinking speed increased, his gaze sharpened, and he became more attuned to his surroundings. He could even sense Chirp's mood, which was one of boredom, as she longed to continue fighting goblins. Overall, the upgrade improved his mix of abilities, such as perception and intuition. Most importantly, the skill points gained from leveling up could now be used to enhance his class skills or unlock new ones. Lin considered whether to improve his monster contract technique or acquire a new skill. Lin considered that upgrading his contract technique to allow for multiple monster contracts was appealing, but finding a powerful matriarch monster like the spider on short notice was unlikely. Since the goblins were no match for the spider, he decided it might be better to focus on a class skill instead. The boost in morale from level zero was helpful, but Lin knew that enhancing his class skill, which was related to forming contracts with monsters, could make a significant difference in crucial moments. He reasoned that while the spider matriarch's attributes might not improve much in the future, the enhanced class skills would help maintain her strength. Once they reached higher levels, level zero mentality training would no longer suffice, so it was time to start using level one mentality training. With 100 points left, Lin decided to spend 60 points on a blue quality training technique, expecting it to be of excellent quality. The automatic training from the blue quality technique proved to be much faster and more efficient compared to the white quality common technique. Considering the remaining points, Lin thought about exchanging them for additional gear. He also wanted to boost Chirp's mood, so he suggested that they continue fighting goblins. Chirp's excitement at the prospect of more battles was evident, and she happily agreed to press on. They both killed a few goblins, and Lin mentioned that the first thing to do after leveling up was to experiment with their newfound strength by testing it on a goblin. Since goblins usually move in groups, a chaotic brawl wouldn't be suitable for him to test his skills. He was thankful to encounter a lone goblin. As Crip was about to kill it as well, Lin stopped her, asking to handle it himself. She stepped back, and as the goblin charged with a stone hammer, Lin created a shield to protect himself and commented that the goblin was getting exactly what it paid for. He then demonstrated the multifunctional defense orb, which, worth 40 points, could defend against most attacks once activated. However, each time it blocked an attack, the orb's energy was consumed. From current experiments, a full-force attack by a regular forest goblin soldier only used up 1% of its energy. With that level of defense, there was nothing to fear in the early stages anymore. It was time to test his attack power after leveling up. He told her to behold his level 1 full-force serious punch, which was his strongest strike. Despite its power, it had no effect on the goblin, which seemed confused. When the goblin attacked him, Lin ordered Crip to kill it. Even after leveling up, Lin admitted that he was still the weak mascot with no strength, but his skills had become completely effective. He thought not to be fooled by Crip's enhancements. She had only gained one point in strength and one in agility. However, the improvement was significant. Originally, a frontal attack on the forest goblin squad would have led to a deadlock, but now, with the enhancements, a massacre could be initiated. His best route to becoming stronger was to focus on mentality, as it cost the fewest points to upgrade and was highly efficient. Relying on the blue excellent quality training technique could only increase mentality by four points, and for more, he might have to depend on random gear from treasure chests. However, getting tasks that reward treasure chests was a rare opportunity, so he needed to trigger as many quests as possible. 
Lin noted that although Crip still struggled against grouped goblins and had even suffered losses before, boosting her morale at critical moments could help turn the tide and seek revenge. Crip responded not to underestimate her because of her background. The scene shifts to a family terrified by a goblin that had killed a man. The daughter tells her mother that she won't go any further and begs her to leave her behind. The mother refuses, insisting that they will either die together or survive together. As the goblins prepare to attack them, Crip arrives and kills the goblin. The woman wonders if this spider is the same one from earlier, questioning why it is helping them. The scene then shifts to Lou and his team, who are hiding behind bushes. Lou mentions that there is a goblin stronghold ahead, and, after days of preparation, it is now the perfect time to strike. He instructs everyone to get ready. They hear sounds from the stronghold, and Lou wonders about the nature of the noise and whether there is a battle occurring. He also speculates about the team that acted before his own. Upon investigation, he discovers that it is the spider monsters that had killed Wei. He warns his teammates to be cautious and avoid exposing themselves. He reflects on how the spider monsters had been incredibly strong the last time they faced them, and despite his team's significant growth, they might still struggle to defeat them. The monster had already killed Wei without reason, viewing humans as enemies. It is currently attacking the goblins, but they must avoid being discovered by it. As Crip kills the remaining goblins, she teleports away. A boy asks Lu about the origin of the monster that massacred the forest goblins. Lu replies that if he's not mistaken, it's likely a special elite monster arranged by the ancient god. They are no match for it at the moment, so if they encounter it, they must avoid it at all costs. He realizes that his team seems disheartened and decides to offer encouragement. He tells them not to be discouraged, and once they are strong enough, they might consider challenging such elite monsters. Defeating them would be extremely difficult, but the rewards would be substantial. Meanwhile, many warriors witness Crip killing numerous goblins. Some are grateful and believe this is the work of the ancient god, while others are frustrated that Crip has killed all the goblins. Half of the month had already passed in exploration, and a significant portion of the area had been covered. Lin, reflecting on their progress while sitting, considered their efforts. Despite being outnumbered by forest goblins and inevitably sustaining injuries, Crip need points for spent on healing gear. The rewards were substantial, and Lin had saved another 60 points. He discovered that after leveling up, Crip now operated within a range of 500 meters from Lin's maximum distance. Unfortunately, the morale boost had a range limit, so Lin would need to stay close behind Crip to be ready to support her with skills at any time. Lin had just received a treasure chest as a reward for killing 10 goblins within a minute. He remarked that he hadn't expected that diligently killing monsters and completing tasks would trigger an achievement reward. Curious, he decided to see what was inside the chest. When he tapped on it, the screen indicated that he wouldn't be able to open it. Lin wondered if there were location restrictions for opening the treasure chest and if they would need to wait for a specific time. The screen then showed that Lin's infamous reputation had spread among the nearby goblin tribes. Under the call of the forest goblin shaman, a united army was being formed to hunt Lin down. Lin speculated that if the previous forest goblin squad had about 10 members, the formation of a new team might indicate something significant was coming his way. The scene shifts to the 18th night of exploration, where, in a goblin base, a masked individual was glowing with power. A goblin was kneeling in front of the masked figure. A spear was emitting an effect that caused the goblins to gather. The scene shifts to the 23rd day of exploration, where Lin reflects on the situation. Despite knowing that something big was coming, he decides to lay low for a while. Crip's strength had improved significantly, and although Lin had exchanged some useful gear, he felt frustrated hiding his own talents. Seeing Crip ready, he told her that while they could disdain the enemy strategically, they must take them seriously tactically. Thus, he had refrained from exploring in the last two days, opting instead to look for a suitable ambush spot nearby, and he had indeed found one. Standing in front of a destroyed base, Lin noted that it appeared to be an abandoned tribe with crumbling stone walls. With Crip's spider silk, it was ideal for setting traps. After preparing the traps, Lin cleared the goblins in the area but intentionally allowed a few to escape. The goblin army, receiving this message, would likely head straight for the ambush site. Once the spider matriarch had finished creating her webs, she gained the ability to sense intruders within a 300-meter radius after upgrading. This way, Lin could be alerted as soon as the goblin army approached and avoid being ambushed. He had also prepared a teleport scroll worth five points each, capable of transporting him back to his base in five seconds. This was much more effective than the previous scrolls for making a quick getaway. In case the army proved stronger than he anticipated, he had a backup plan. As Lin saw Crip becoming alert, he wondered if the army was approaching and was eager to see the power of the combined forces targeting him. 
He hid and observed as a large group of different goblins arrived. He recognized them as a group of level one cavalry with unusual mounts and realized the situation was critical. It was time to use the boost morale skill. Crip engaged the goblins, and Lin thought that with Crip's enhancements, as long as she wasn't completely surrounded, there would be no danger. The home ground that Lin had prepared in advance was proving effective, and the enemy forces had fallen deeply into the trap. As the goblins were caught in the districted pillars, Lin instructed Crip to use the trap. The goblins were bewildered, and Crip began to eliminate them. Lin was pleased with their progress, but noticed that the task was not showing as completed. Suddenly, a goblin appeared behind Crip, preparing to attack her. Lin quickly teleported Crip near himself, saving her from the goblin's strike. As the goblin turned invisible, Lin grabbed his scroll and realized he couldn't understand what the goblin was saying, which seemed to be some kind of taunt about death. Lin, unsure how to deal with the situation, activated the teleport skill. With the goblin closing in, Lin and Crip teleported away just in time. They arrived at the player base, and Lin commented that the teleport scrolls had been worth their cost. He had set the destination to a place where no one was around and didn't expect to end up in such a situation. Hearing some noise, he told Crip that someone was coming and asked her to hide behind him. Since the player base was known for attracting attention due to her high profile and snatching monster kills, other players might cause trouble if they found her. Crip quickly concealed herself in Lin's shadow. As a man passed by, Lin reflected on the tough goblin shaman they had encountered. He knew they needed to figure out how to become stronger, but first needed to find a secluded spot to open the chest. He noticed some warriors returning from their exploration. One boy mentioned that they had successfully completed a mission and had the chance to exchange for some impressive weapons. Lin saw Lu's team and thought about how Lu managed to exploit his teammates while keeping them loyally under his control. If not for the panel prompt revealing Lu's scheming nature, Lin might have been deceived by him as well. Continuing his walk, Lin saw many injured individuals. A boy approached Lin, boasting about his substantial properties in reality, including 400 boxes of cash, which he promised to give Lin once they returned, along with securing Lin a high rank. However, he requested Lin's points in exchange. Lin ignored him, thinking that despite their exploration and hunting, some players were still fixated on their real-world wealth and power. It was no wonder they ended up in such a state. Lin entered a street, ensuring that no one was following him. With Wei dead, no one else cared about him, so it was the perfect time to open the chest. He hoped for something that would boost his combat power, ideally gear that enhanced his mentality attributes. Reaching level 2 might enable him to take down the shaman goblin with Crip. As he opened the chest, Lin noted that the ancient god categorized gear from low to high as white, blue, purple, gold, and red ranks. The store only sold up to blue excellent quality gear, and Lin wondered if he might receive a purple rare quality item. Lin was pleased with what he found. He recalled encountering the shaman before and noted that it was only at level 1. With the pill he had acquired, Lin could now face a level 4 opponent, deserving of its purple quality. He thought about how he could infiltrate the goblin group, sneak up on the shaman, and deliver a decisive strike. However, he needed to overcome the language barrier to blend in with the goblins. Lin asked his shopping assistant to recommend any items that would facilitate communication with goblins. He obtained an item for five points, and he thought the recommendation was spot on. It felt as though the AI had already figured out his preferences. Since they were at the base, Lin decided to take advantage of the assistant's product recommendations and went straight to the mall to purchase the item. The scene shifts to the 26th day of exploration. The goblin army was on the move, killing warriors along the way. The shaman commanded the scouts to deploy, seek out the foe who had slain many of their kind, and signal with a horn upon discovery. They were to wait for the others to support them, and, if they encountered any humans, kill them immediately without wasting time on the spoils. Their primary target was the first racial nemesis. As a goblin prepared to kill a human, he heard a rustling noise from behind. Chirp quickly killed the goblin, causing it to scream in agony. The other goblins heard the commotion and saw the scouts, who appeared to be in a state of panic. Lin approached them and inquired about the situation. Lin was looking like Goblin to those all and explained that he had spotted the Goblin's nemesis and was being pursued, urging for backup. Another scout was instructed to blow the horn urgently. The shaman, upon hearing the horn, arrived on the scene and wondered about the presence of their nemesis and the detectable spider, as well as its master. He asked where they were. Lin pointed out the location where he had seen them. Lin noted that so many Goblins had not suspected his true identity, and he was impressed with how effectively he blended in like water in the sea. The shaman remarked that there was no good spot for setting traps in that direction, and instructed not to let the cavalry miss him. 
Lin realized that he was currently without any enhancement buffs and was completely unguarded against the shaman. He told the shaman he had crucial information to report about the human. The shaman urged him to speak quickly and not delay him from pursuing their enemy. Lin mentioned the revenge related to the shaman's previous hammer strike, but the shaman did not understand. Lin clarified that he intended to repay that with the shaman's own head. The shaman was puzzled by this and was caught off guard as Chirp attacked from behind. As other goblins moved in to confront Lin and Chirp, Lin activated the boost morale skill. He thought that after dealing with this minor boss, the remaining minions would be easy to handle. Chirp efficiently took them down, and Lin was impressed with the new boost morale class skill. He eagerly anticipated what the third skill would be like, though it would only unlock at level 5. A goblin mentioned that all of their kind carried the blessings of the great shaman, acting as a deterrent. Lin had already killed enough goblins, and if he continued, the deity's curse would haunt him. Lin questioned whether they were serious about this so-called curse. Finally, the screen displayed that Lin's mission was complete, and he received Agatha's chest as a reward. Lin pondered if the increased hatred from the forest goblins was indeed a curse. The mention of the great shaman sounded far more formidable than a regular shaman, likely at least level 2. He thought it might be best to find a way to eradicate the goblins entirely. As he turned, a goblin wondered if Lin was frightened. Another suggested that they might survive the encounter. Lin replied that he planned to separate them and interrogate them individually. If their stories did not match, they could imagine the consequences. He asked where they lived, if the great shaman resided there, and inquired about his strength and other pertinent details. The goblins were terrified, and one of them admitted that Lin was indeed the enemy of the forest goblins. Lin assured them that if they answered honestly, he would make their end as easy as possible, and that they had nothing to fear from him, as he was not a demon. The scene shifts to the stronghold of the ancient god, where the strongest warriors are holding a meeting. Lu notes that everyone must have observed that the forest goblins they recently encountered were significantly stronger than the initial ones. Lei interjects, stating that as monsters grow, they become more powerful, and his only concern is that the monsters might become too weak to withstand a punch after he levels up. Yan adds that unlike those weaklings who couldn't even score a single point, they, as strong warriors, are different. Lu explains that the situation is complex and that his team was fortunate enough to explore deeper territories and trigger a mainline hunting mission. This mission could be shared with others, and now he is presenting it to them all. He isn't trying to scare anyone, but he believes that when the time comes, none of them will be safe. To survive, they must unite to complete the mainline mission. Jung, suspecting that Lu might have ulterior motives, urges caution. After reviewing the mission, Jung suggests that since they are collaborating, a leader is necessary. He points out that Lu, who has actively shared crucial information and has leadership experience, should take on this role. Lu initially thinks Jung is trying to put him on the spot, but he had already anticipated this scenario. Lu proposes that, since they are all strong and opinionated individuals, they should form a council to discuss matters collectively and decide on team strategies through voting. Lei and Yan agree to this council idea. Min clarifies that if the council's decisions go against her beliefs, she will leave immediately. Lu reassures her not to worry, stating that the council is open to members joining or leaving as needed, and they won't question anyone's departure. He then shifts the focus back to business and begins discussing how to complete the main mission. Lin was engaged in eliminating goblins and considered that it was thanks to Chirp's enhanced strength that they had successfully wiped out the elite forest goblin troop led by a shaman. He was determined to keep the fact that he could transform into a forest goblin from leaking out and had interrogated over a dozen goblins. Through various comparisons, he was confident that the information was reliable, the goblins of the entire forest were part of a unified group, and to completely eradicate them, the key lay deep within the territory of the Thunder Tribe of Goblins. The screen displayed the mission details, and Lin noted that the exploration and hunting missions assigned by the ancient gods were far from simple. On the 32nd day of exploration, Min was walking with several warriors when a boy asked where they were headed. Min responded that the goblins were numerous and highly skilled and even if they banded together without systematic training, they might not have an advantage in group combat. She explained that they had previously encountered a goblin cavalry, and those centaurs were clearly enslaved and tormented slaves rather than tame mounts. She speculated that, in addition to the forest goblin tribe, there was also a centaur tribe, making them the two primary enemies. Meanwhile, Loon and others were diligently working to recruit more people and train them to ensure their combat strength. Her squad's mission was to locate the centaur tribe and try to persuade them to join forces against the forest goblins. The boy remarked on the importance of their mission. Lin thought that, due to the unexpected threat from the forest goblins, 
the great shaman of the Thunder Tribe had issued a summoning order, with other tribes sending representatives to the Thunder Tribe. As the goblins walked together, one of them asked Lin which tribe he was from and why he was wandering alone. Lin replied that he was a hunter from the Raptor Tribe and was hoping to witness the grandeur of the great shaman at the Thunder Tribe. He believed that blending in with the group of goblins to infiltrate the Thunder Tribe would be a straightforward task. The goblin grew friendly and mentioned that he was close with the great shaman, and upon reaching the Thunder Tribe, could introduce Lin to him. Lin marveled at how he had stumbled into such an unusual situation. At night, while all the goblins were sleeping, Lin lay beside them as well. The friendly goblin approached and asked if Lin was asleep. Lin suspected that they were merely enduring the goblin's presence, but the situation seemed to be escalating into a night raid, and he could no longer tolerate it. He ordered Chirp to prepare for action. She positioned herself behind the goblin, and Lin instructed her to choose a good angle and avoid splattering blood on him. As Chirp prepared to strike, an arrow suddenly struck the goblin. Lin was perplexed, wondering what was happening. He speculated that a warrior with a bow might be sniping from a distance. He noticed a flurry of arrows being fired at the goblins, killing them while they slept. Lin considered the possibility that these might be top-ranked warriors. Although his substitute pill had not yet expired, he realized that even if he claimed to be human, he wouldn't be trusted. Conversely, even if it was revealed that Chirp and Lin were connected, the attacker might not deduce that Lin was her master. Lin quickly sought cover to protect himself and informed Chirp that the enemy was a spider hiding in the shadows. He advised her to retreat. As arrows rained down, Chirp deflected them all, but one arrow changed course and struck the cover. Lin noticed that this arrow had consumed 2% of the shield's energy, indicating a powerful attack. He realized that the sniper had him locked on, and unless he used something like spatial teleportation, there was no way to shake them off. Although he had prepared a town return scroll for an emergency escape after infiltrating the forest goblin tribe, using it now would be a waste. Lin observed Chirp blocking all the arrows and wondered how they could give up without even fighting. He still had some tricks up his sleeve and instructed Chirp to be ready to use the boost morale. She agreed and took her position. However, the enemy's attack suddenly ceased, leaving Lin puzzled. He saw a centaur lady attacking them. The centaur lady believed the forest goblins were her enemies but there was a child among them. Lin checked her profile and noted that while her physique was slightly weak, her agility surpassed even Chirp's, reaching the limits for level 1. Her fluctuating attitude was a bad sign, and it was unclear what grudge she might hold against the forest goblins. Lin thought it would be unjust if he were killed due to her misplaced anger. He also remembered that translation jellybeans could translate the centaur's language, so he decided to use one remote shopping opportunity to exchange for 10 jellybeans at once. The effects of the jelly beans didn't overlap but worked simultaneously, making it a worthwhile investment. Lin approached the centaur lady and asked if she would listen to his explanation. She asked if he was one of her kind. Lin replied that he was also a centaur, transformed by a vicious curse from the forest goblins. She seemed saddened, recognizing him as a fellow victim. Lin continued, explaining how an evil female forest goblin shaman had killed his family, cursed him, and cast him into the wilderness, hoping he would be hunted down by outsiders and meet his end. Lin chose to endure the humiliation and infiltrate a group of forest goblins with the aim of entering their tribe and seeking revenge on the shaman. He was unexpectedly confronted by the centaur lady. She placed her hand on his head and told him that it was time for him to be strong. Lin noticed that the centaur spoke in a somewhat disjointed manner, which made communication challenging, but fortunately, he had managed to understand her personality. Chirp, however, was displeased with the situation. The centaur lady, seeing Chirp, acknowledged her. Lin tell that Chirp had made a contract with Lin and was always taking care of and protecting him. She expressed her gratitude to Chirp, mentioning that Chirp was very kind. Lin observed that compared to Chirp's cautious protection, the centaur lady was more open-minded. While Chirp's affection was deep and loving, the centaur lady's sympathy seemed to stem from Lin's pitiable state. Lin considered this dynamic and thought it might be worth leveraging the centaur lady's grudge against the goblins. Lin suggested to the centaur lady that, since they both had issues with the goblins, they should work together. He also proposed that gathering her tribe would be advantageous, as strength lies in numbers. When she did not respond, Lin speculated that her people might have all fallen victim to the forest goblins. The centaur lady then confirmed that all her known kin were gone. Lin had suspected a war between the two races when he saw forest goblins riding centaurs, believing the goblins to be in the stronger position. It was now clear that the centaurs had been completely wiped out. Lin asked the centaur lady if she hadn't mentioned that the survivors of such trials grew stronger over time. 
he encouraged her to seek vengeance for the deceased, explaining that although he had become a cursed form despised by all, it allowed him to blend in with the forest goblin tribe. If they attacked from within, they could achieve significant results. Lin inquired if she agreed with this plan and assured her that Chirp could hide in his shadow and follow him into the tribe without any issue. He then instructed Chirp to conceal herself. The centaur lady asked where the entrance was and expressed her willingness to accompany him. Lin explained that Chirp could follow him because of their contract, but if the centaur lady wanted to sneak into the forest goblin tribe with him, they might need a different method, one that might be uncomfortable for her. He asked if she was willing to endure that. She agreed, driven by her desire for revenge. Lin produced a lock and asked her to act as his slave. She was shocked by the suggestion. Lin reassured her that the cursed strength of the evil gear had already dissipated, and it was now just a plain collar. He asked her to wear it so she could pose as his slave, enabling them to infiltrate the forest goblin tribe together. She hesitated as she tapped the collar, wondering if it was truly harmless. Lin recalled his recent encounter where he had used a sneak attack to neutralize the forest goblin cavalry and tried to unlock the centaur's collar, hoping they could aid him. Unexpectedly, when the mind-reading slave collar was destroyed, a dark mist seeped into the centaur's brain, driving her mad and causing her to attack everything indiscriminately. Lin learned from the attribute panel that destroying the collar triggered a madness curse. With no way to lift the curse, he had no choice but to let Chirp deal with her. He concluded that it was futile to attempt saving centaurs who had become slaves. It was better to kill them. However, once the madness curse was activated, the collar lost all its power and became merely a common item. Lin recovered the collars from the deceased centaur and considered if they could locate the centaur tribe. They might negotiate and sneak a team of fake slaves into the forest goblin tribe to create some disruption. In the end, only one collar proved useful. Before officially proceeding with their plan, Lin decided it was crucial to confirm the centaur's name. He asked the centaur lady for her name. She introduced herself as Mia. Lin noted that the centaur naming convention seemed to align more with Western styles. Since he was pretending to be one of them, he needed to ensure his own name fit seamlessly into their naming system. Lin then revealed his own name and instructed Mia to play her role as his slave convincingly, maintaining a dazed and mind-wiped appearance. Mia assured him that she would act well to seek her revenge. Lin hoped that with some training she would perform effectively and that his remaining supply of substitute pills would last. The scene shifts to the 35th day of exploration. At the goblin base, a voice called out to the forest goblins from afar, stating that those who wish to enter the Thunder Tribe must show respect to the Great Shaman. He, as the most trusted confidant of the Great Shaman, would convey their respects. A plump goblin presented a bone flute as a sign of respect. The first goblin remarked that the flute was something his house had been needing, and recognizing the goblin's good intentions allowed him entry. A leader goblin observed a family of goblins. The head of the family presented some valuable fruits, expressing their respect for the great shaman. The leader goblin, angered, smashed the fruits and questioned whether such trash could truly honor the great shaman. He then ordered the goblins to deal with the family. The lady and her daughter begged to be spared, pleading for her husband's release. The leader goblin responded that he required two female slaves, making it impossible for him to let the husband go. A second goblin reported to the leader that more refugees had arrived, including a wealthy-looking centaur slave. The leader goblin saw the arrival of racial enemies and recognized it as an opportunity to profit. Lin, walking with Mia, thought she looked foolish but was actually quite astute. With just one more day of training, she could act convincingly. After another day of travel to reach the tribe, he noted that he now had only six substitute pills left. As they approached, a goblin called for Lin to stop for a routine check. As a group of goblins approached Lin, he wondered if they were the ruthlessly exploited yokels he'd heard about. Despite the small scale of the forest goblin tribes, they still managed to accomplish impressive feats. Lin was prepared for this, having taken a substitute pill that allowed him to replace the original forest goblin emissary. As Lin prepared to speak, one of the goblins mentioned the words of the great shaman with the arrival of racial enemies. Many other forest goblins from neighboring tribes had sought refuge here. They were conducting thorough checks to prevent lowly civilians from entering the noble lands of the Thunder Tribe. Lin mused that it seemed inevitable for any intelligent race to develop societal inequalities. Just then, he received a new quest, a face-slapping mission. He wondered why the mission descriptions were becoming stranger after entering the Forest Goblin Tribe. The goblin then turned to Mia, remarking that as a slave she couldn't simply walk in without paying a tax. Mia, playing her role as a slave, spaced out. The leader goblin commented that, judging by her appearance, 
Mia wasn't meant for battle, but for pleasure. He demanded a tax of 100 bone coins to ensure Lin could still enjoy his slave after fleeing. Lin, prepared for this, decided to act. He had triggered the face-slapping quest as well. Lin declared that he was an emissary of the Lion Tribe and had close ties with the great shaman of the Thunder Tribe. He warned the goblin not to act foolishly and produced a stone to back up his claim, which shocked the goblin. The goblin now believed Lin was indeed an emissary of noble standing, especially if he had ties with the great shaman. Other goblins gathered, asking why this emissary from another tribe was causing such a stir. One of them demanded Lin pay up or risk having his slave confiscated. However, the goblin leader quickly kicked the second goblin, scolding him for not realizing the importance of Lin's visit. The leader apologized, urging Lin not to take offense. Lin glanced at the goblin family that had been tortured earlier. He stated that they were from his tribe and ordered that they come with him. The goblin leader, eager to appease Lin, agreed and instructed his followers to release the family. The goblin family knelt before Lin, thanking him profusely. Lin found the situation bizarre. Revealing his emissary status and rescuing civilians from a crisis should have been enough to complete the face-slapping quest, but there was no prompt indicating success. He wondered if, by forest goblin standards, he needed to physically slap someone for the quest to register. However, as a mere emissary, starting a fight with the tribal guards would be a diplomatic disaster. Not knowing how forest goblins handled such situations, Lin decided not to risk it. He instructed the goblin leader not to announce his arrival to the great shaman, as he preferred to visit the shaman on his own. The goblin leader agreed. Lin reflected on the situation and decided to forget about the minor quest with its meager rewards. He reminded himself that the Thunder Tribe was the largest in the area, with the entire tribe divided into three levels based on terrain. The lowest level was mostly inhabited by non-combatant civilian forest goblins. The second level was the residence of the combat-capable forest goblin soldiers, and the top level was reserved for the nobles, who lived in luxury without having to engage in any duties. The goblins had inherited the blood of their ancestral kind, granting them heightened mental powers and the ability to master unimaginable spells unique to their race. The tribe was ruled by the noble goblin shaman, a master of sorcery. Unlike other tribes, this central capital was the birthplace of the world's forest goblins and home to the most revered great shaman. As Lin ascended the stairs, a goblin guard informed him that the sacred temple grounds were off-limits to outsiders. Even as the grand emissary, Lin couldn't simply enter unannounced. The great shaman had instructed that all tribal emissaries would be summoned to discuss how to handle their enemies. Lin realized that despite his status, he would not be granted immediate access and it seemed that the previous emissary's claims of close ties with the great shaman were exaggerated. Lin was relieved he hadn't acted too arrogantly, which might have jeopardized their cover. Despite his emissary status, gaining access to the great shaman would require a different approach. Lin was fortunate that the goblin emissary had boasted endlessly about his large villa in the Thunder Tribe and had invited Lin to visit. This information made it easier for Lin to find a place to stay. Once Lin, Mia, and Krip reached their temporary residence, Lin informed Mia that this would be their base for now, and thanked her for acting as his slave. Mia, though not tired, expressed her sympathy for the lower-tier goblins, saying it was unfortunate they had to rely on Lin's help. Lin acknowledged Mia's sentiment, but reminded her that their primary target was the great shaman of the forest goblins, not the common goblins. He found Mia's sympathy for her own enemies somewhat naive, but kept his plans to himself. Lin had other strategies in mind for aiding the forest goblin family, he then turned to Crip, instructing her to hold off on setting traps for now. Lin had come up with a different plan and needed some time to implement it. Lin explained that his original plan was to pose as an emissary, invite the great shaman as a guest, and then stab him in the kidney, leaving the tribe headless and in utter chaos. Mia was cheered by this revelation. Lin continued that, upon entering the tribe, he observed the signs and realized that although an emissary's status was higher than that of a typical forest goblin, it was nowhere near that of the great shaman. Even if he issued an invitation, the great shaman would not come. Lin then revealed the entire plan to both of them. They made their way to the assembly square of the forest goblins, where as long as the ancestral war drum was struck, the entire tribe would gather, regardless of their activities. According to tribal rules, the ancestral war drum could only be struck in emergency cases requiring the mobilization of the entire tribe or by order of the great shaman. Lin struck the drum, and a goblin came to question how he dared to beat the ancestral war drum, ordering others to capture Lin. Another goblin argued that they could not act recklessly since Lin was an emissary from the esteemed lion tribe, a noble born with great prestige. 
More goblins arrived, curious about the source of the sound. Lin thought that since he was an emissary from a different tribe, even if the guards were concerned, they would not act rashly. In the forest goblin language, they really did use the Great One to address their superiors. One goblin hoped it was not the Great Shaman ordering their expulsion. Finally, all the goblins gathered, and Lin thought that with most of the forest goblins from the tribe assembled, they could begin. He announced that he was an emissary from the Lion Tribe and had an important message to deliver, making that day no ordinary day. Some questioned why the drum player was unknown, and why they had not seen their shaman, wondering if it was the great shaman who had summoned them. Lin claimed that in his dreams, he had received a revelation from their ancestors, and that day, he stood on their behalf to guide them in vanquishing their racial enemies and ensuring that every forest goblin would lead a happy life. A goblin wondered if this was a revelation from the great ancestors. Lin asked if they had noticed that life had been getting tougher lately. As commoners, had they realized that they were receiving less food and doing more work? Had they observed that no matter how valiantly they fought and defeated those from other races, the rewards for their bravery could never compensate for the blood and sweat they shed in battle? Did they even understand why this was happening to them? They all responded that it was because of the enemies of their race. Lin told them they were wrong. The true cause was not the enemies of their race, but rather the injustice within their tribe. A goblin questioned whether the great shaman had said it was all caused by the enemies of their race. Another goblin mentioned that the situation was so complicated that he did not understand what the injustice was. Lin felt his speech should have been stirring, and wondered if he had overestimated the intelligence of the forest goblins. Some seemed not to grasp his point, and others weren't even paying attention. Fortunately, the others could not see the prompt screen from his assistant, so he could shop in secret, even while standing in front of them. He asked the shopping assistant if there was any gear that could enhance his persuasiveness and stir up the crowd, preferably something under 50 points. The assistant replied that there was nothing available under 50 points. Lin asked to remove the price limit, requesting the cheapest option available. He ended up with an item costing 70 points, which he thought was useless outside of that specific environment. It was nothing compared to the rare purple gear from the chest, and he was unsure where to find the remaining 10 points. A goblin asked Lin what he was doing and a tribe guard arrived to maintain order, instructing that all goblins must not cause trouble. Lin realized it was the forest goblin guard who had triggered the physical face-slapping quest. The goblin informed Lin that before coming there, he had consulted other shamans, and the great shaman did not even know the emissary from the lion tribe. Lin saw this as the perfect opportunity and prepared to deliver a face-slapping punch. Afterward, Lin was rewarded with 20 points. Although the punch had not caused any real harm, the task was completed, and the minimum reward of 20 points was given. The goblin attacked him, demanding to know how he dared to start a fight in the ancestor's square. Initially, the goblin had intended to ask Lin for money since he was an emissary, but now he was set on killing him. Lin shouted for him to be quiet, and the goblin found he could no longer control himself. Lin told Mike that they were supposed to be the tribe's protectors, but instead, they were focused on making a profit. Every tribesman who entered or exited had to pay that one goblin, whose actions were despicable and shameless. Lin declared that their fellow tribesmen would rather eat his flesh and drink his blood. He thought that after enhancing his incitement skill with gear, the effect was immediate. Others agreed with Lin and told the guard goblin that they did not want someone like him in their midst. One goblin remarked that the guard had obtained his position by selling his wife and usually bullied the lowborn. Now he was being punished by those he had previously oppressed, despite being promoted. Another goblin suggested firing the guard goblin which would make the commoners grateful and also provide an opportunity to gain another female forest goblin slave, making it a better situation overall. Others even suggested killing the guard goblin to eliminate any further trouble. Then the great shaman arrived, and everyone made way for him. Lin examined the great shaman's profile and realized that this was not the true great shaman. The actual great shaman was the supreme leader of the tribe and, with the thousands under his command, would not be easily lured out. The guard goblin knelt before the shaman, claiming that he was the only guard and that Lin was the troublemaker. The shaman asked Lin which tribe he was from to dare cause trouble on this sacred land blessed by their great ancestors. Lin declared that he was a saint from the lion tribe, following the divine oracle of their great ancestors and a pioneer destined to lead the forest goblin race to greatness once again. He thought that the debauched shaman, drained by indulgence and appearing high-ranking, was likely an heir to the great shaman, it seemed his luck was not too bad after all. The goblins admitted they were unsure of what Lin was saying, but he appeared far more formidable than the giant fang. As Lin spoke, they were increasingly drawn to him. 
He proclaimed that the shaman was not the true great shaman but was still acting as though he were. Some goblins had twisted the great ancestor's oracle, creating inequality and forging so-called nobility, leading to the exploitation of the forest goblins by other goblins. The shaman declared that he would not tolerate Lin's useless talk, then kicked a goblin and ordered others to summon more goblins. Lin continued to describe how the goblins were mistreated and struggled as slaves, fueling their rage against the shaman. The shaman warned Lin that no matter who he was, he had offended their great ancestors by striking the ancestral war drum on his own and dared to challenge him. He ordered his knights to take Lin down. As the guards advanced on Lin, other goblins blocked their way. One goblin stated that the nameless one, Lin, was speaking sincerely for the forest goblin tribe, and if they wanted to harm him, they would first have to kill them all. The shaman, enraged, demanded to know how these lowly commoners dared to bear their fangs at nobility, and he ordered their extermination. Lady goblins arrived to support Lin and told the shaman he would not harm them. The shaman warned them not to be fooled, claiming that the nobles shared his blood and that their ancestors had sacrificed everything for the tribe. It was only because of them that the others enjoyed their current status. The guards asked the shaman if they should charge in, with one mentioning that his mother was among those supporting Lin. Lin realized that due to the greed and cruelty of the high-ranking goblins and the accumulated class conflict, it had been relatively easy to incite the lower-class goblins. However, only the lower-class forest goblins and some female goblins were willing to stand up, while the main fighting force of the goblins remained passive. This situation was insufficient to bring down the great shaman, so Lin needed to find a way to exploit the growing unrest among the goblins. He called for the tribesmen to listen and announced that he would surrender himself to the shaman. He asked the shaman to have him locked up, and raising his hands, began to descend the stairs. Some of the lady goblins were shocked and asked why Lin was surrendering. Lin explained that he had come to bring fairness and a better life to their kind. If everyone had to argue and hurt each other just to protect him, it would contradict his intentions. Therefore, he was willing to be bound voluntarily, ready to bear the sins of their race so that his kin could be redeemed. He urged everyone to remember this day and strive to eliminate the injustice so that his sacrifice would not be in vain. The goblins became emotional, touched by Lin's dedication, and many began to cry. Lin approached the shaman, asking him to take him away. Some of the ladies warned the shaman not to harm Lin, or they would not let it go. The shaman replied that he intended to kill Lin. A guard added that killing Lin would provoke outrage among the goblins. He then suggested that Lin be locked in the rotting dungeon, and, once they had dealt with their racial enemies, the great shaman would surely give him a fair trial. He advised everyone to stay on the straight and narrow, or even the nobles would face punishment if the great shaman blamed them. As Lin was being taken away, he felt that things were still under his control. The scene shifted to another goblin base, which had been burned and its inhabitants killed by Lu and his team. Examining the map, Lu noted that by taking down the goblin stronghold and establishing a position there, they could gather strength and prepare to attack the forest goblin headquarters. A boy arrived reporting that Min and her team had returned. Lu asked if they had found any reinforcements. Zhang wondered if they had returned any later. They might have already taken down the forest goblin tribe with their own strength. Min reported that she had only found the ruins of the centaur tribe, and from the remaining traces, it appeared that the race had been wiped out by the forest goblins. Lu questioned if the forest goblins were so formidable that they had already defeated a race before Min's arrival, and now there were no reinforcements. Lei dismissed the concern, saying that no reinforcements did not matter. They were all warriors enhanced by the ancient gods, and they should not fear mere forest goblins. Lu considered that while their elite warriors could defeat regular goblin soldiers in one-on-one -on -one combat, they had too few elites, and facing the forest goblin army head-on would be dangerous due to their overwhelming numbers. This made it difficult to ensure safety. Improvising attributes could only be achieved through cumulative training techniques, and enhancing gear was limited by rank. Even with many points, significant improvements in strength could not be achieved quickly. Lu concluded that without reinforcements, they would need to revise their combat strategy. He decided that they must pool their spare points to boost the overall strength of the ancient god warriors, giving them a better chance against the forest goblin army. He encouraged everyone to help each other by sharing their collective points to arm all the ancient god warriors. As the leader, Lu felt it was his duty to lead by example, making sacrifices to inspire his team. He hoped that the rewards from the ancient gods would justify his current sacrifices once the mission was completed. On the 36th day of exploration, the shaman arrived at the prison where Lin was held. He instructed the guards to keep watch at the door, ensure that no one without authorization approached, and ignore any screams, no matter how awful. The guard assured him that he would follow the orders and admitted his own disdain for Lin, 
even mentioning that his family had advised him to take good care of the prisoner. The shaman entered Lin's cell. Lin asked why the shaman had taken so long to visit and expressed anticipation for this moment. The shaman explained that the great shaman had heard of Lin's deeds and had decided to execute him publicly after they defeated their racial enemies, in honor of the great ancestors. While he could not kill Lin immediately, he intended to torment him in the meantime. He asked if Lin was still looking forward to the visit. Lin replied that he was indeed looking forward to it and was pleased with the shaman's cooperation, which had saved him a lot of trouble. The shaman then attacked Lin, telling him to enjoy his moment because soon he would make Lin scream his throat out. Lin signaled Chirp to make a move. Chirp appeared behind the shaman, shocking him, and launched an attack. The shaman wondered if he was still alive and pleaded not to be killed, offering anything Lin wanted. He attempted to make enough noise to alert the guards outside. As he began speaking, Chirp used her silk to silence him. Lin told him to be quiet, explaining that he wouldn't kill the shaman because he needed him as a substitute. Moreover, as the forest goblin who had willingly bound himself for justice, escaping would mean admitting guilt. He asked if the shaman understood this logic, and then instructed Chirp to hang him. As the shaman was hung up, Lin informed Mia that the guards had taken his bow and some other items, likely storing them in the next room with miscellaneous items. He asked Mia to search for these items, and she agreed. The shaman thought they were foolish, and doubted the usefulness of their plan, as the guards knew him and would recognize him immediately. Lin noted that, to him, all forest goblins looked quite similar. To prevent the guards from noticing any difference, he decided to make sure the shaman was beaten beyond recognition, so even his own mother wouldn't recognize him. Lin instructed Chirp to slap the shaman, and she obliged, delivering numerous slaps. Outside, two guards laughed, with one commenting on how loud the shaman's torment was, noting that he seemed to use curses. The second guard lamented not being able to witness Lin's suffering, expressing regret at missing it. The shaman was severely injured, and Lin thought it was necessary to strip everything off him to ensure his safety. He praised Chirp for her excellent work, noting that the shaman's limbs were broken, his mouth was gagged, and all his belongings had been taken. This ensured that no forest goblin could recognize him as a substitute. The shaman clung to the hope that the other forest goblins would soon realize he was missing and might come to his rescue. Lin, being kind-hearted, couldn't bear to see the shaman's hope crushed. He decided to send the shaman into despair ahead of time. Lin swallowed a pill, leaving the shaman wondering what he was planning. Lin's transformation into a human form startled the shaman, who wondered if Lin was truly the enemy of their kind. He then saw Lin return to his goblin form and believed that such a transformation was impossible, a nightmare too dreadful to be real. The shaman's mental state began to unravel, struggling to accept the reality before him. Lin observed that with the shaman's mentality in collapse, there was little risk of him using any unknown curses or trying to communicate with the guards. Lin reviewed the attribute panel and noted that the shaman's agility had been enhanced through equipment. After a thorough search, Lin found that the only piece of special equipment on the shaman was a pendant. He speculated that the pendant might be a cursed item and decided to test it. Checking his own profile, he saw no change in agility, but noted an increase in his mentality attribute, attributed to the excellent quality training technique. He was approaching a level up and reflected on whether the situation was becoming inappropriate. Seeing Chirp's interest in the pendant, Lin wondered if she was drawn to it. He decided to offer it to her as a gift, thinking that it was of no use to him and could serve as a small gesture to strengthen their rapport. Lin handed the pendant to Chirp, considering it a way to build goodwill and perhaps earn her favor. As Crip wore the item, she began to glow, and her stats changed. Lin realized that the item was meant for magical creatures, which explained why it hadn't worked for him. The courier enhanced Crip's agility by one, which would be worth at least 100 points if converted to ancient god items. Even though the ancient god exchange shop had various enhancement items, only ancient god warriors could use them, and none of them enhanced mentality. Boosting Crip's physical attributes was far more profitable than enhancing his own, as Lin had experienced before. Crip could carry gear in and out of her shadow, which is why she could always produce a scythe. Lin had initially thought she could only carry something that fit in one hand. Now it seemed that, besides what she was holding, she could also wear special equipment, and if they had a dimensional pocket, she could potentially store items. Lin asked Crip to continue keeping the substitute pill safe and to come back later. She agreed, and taking the box, hid in his shadow. Lin had to admit that the substitute pill was highly effective against low-level monsters. It was a shame that it could only replace beings he had previously encountered. Otherwise, summoning the great ancestors of the forest goblins would make completing tasks a breeze, then Mia arrived to find Lin and asked how he was. 
Lin thanked her for her hard work and explained that he was Lin, so she didn't have to be confused by his changing appearance. Mia looked him over and remarked that he looked quite disheveled. Lin noted that the air felt oppressive and suggested they leave quickly. Mia agreed, and as they exited, Lin explained that he had finished the interrogation and that the Nameless One had confessed to his heinous crimes. From now on, no matter what noise the Nameless One made, they were to ignore it, and no other forest goblins were allowed to visit him or prevent anyone from healing him. A goblin replied that there was no need to worry. Such a criminal who opposed the nobles would suffer appropriately. As the goblin mentioned the slave of the Nameless One, Lin responded that after a friendly exchange, the man had voluntarily offered the centaur slave to please Lin. He asked if there was any problem. The goblin denied it and said that it was to be expected of him to make the prisoner obedient. Lin stated that he had urgent work to attend to and would be leaving. The goblin bowed and wished him well. Lin then noticed the structure in front of him and wondered why he had been given the identity of a shaman. He could try to accomplish something significant, and although he had obtained a shaman's identity and could get close to the great shaman, there seemed to be no opportunity to exploit. He examined the panel of the great shaman and noted that the great shaman's agility attribute had also been enhanced by the equipment. The pendant was more advanced and could increase agility by two points. After reporting his work, Lin left the temple to continue with the disruption plan that Fang had set before leaving. The scene shifts to a goblin base where two warriors were tied up with ropes. The first boy told the second that he had warned him not to go too deep, but the second boy hadn't listened. Now they were both doomed. The first boy had never been in such a situation before. The second boy shouted for him to shut up, saying that if the first boy hadn't run away at the last moment and messed up their formation, their squad could have held out until reinforcements arrived. As a goblin approached to execute them, Lin arrived and asked them to wait. The goblin saw him as Fang and wondered why Fang was there. Lin realized he had originally come to incite the goblin warriors, but hadn't expected to stumble upon the scene involving the human captives. Centaur girls were kind-hearted and couldn't accept such things, so for her sake, he felt compelled to intervene. He then inquired about what was happening. A goblin replied that their squad had been patrolling near the tribe when they encountered a group of bipeds. After a bloody battle, they had captured two live bipeds and were preparing to sacrifice them to the great ancestors. Lin considered that other ancient god warriors had already explored the area near the Thunder Tribe. The first boy, whom Lin appeared to see as a goblin, pleaded with him, asking to be spared. He offered to serve as their slave, revealing that he knew the location and defenses of the ancient god warriors' camp and could guide them. The second boy questioned the first intentions and whether he was planning to betray the warriors' alliance. The first boy replied that he had no loyalty to the alliance and that Lu had only given him a few points, expecting him to risk his life for so little. Lin thought that forming an alliance and giving points to weaklings to strengthen them was not typical of Lu. The second boy called the first one an idiot and asked if he wasn't afraid of failing the main quest and being wiped out by the ancient gods. The first boy responded that he would take as many of them down with him as he could. Lin wondered if Lu had discovered that the main mission required him to deal with the entire forest goblin tribe. A direct assault from the outside would only be feasible if he allied with most of the ancient god warriors, so Lu had to endure the pain and sacrifice himself. The first boy, seeing his usefulness, begged for his life. The second boy questioned whether he really thought the goblins would understand his language. Lin thought that when there were too many people, all sorts of riffraff appeared. He approached the second boy, who said he wouldn't surrender. Lin thought that although they lacked brains and spine, they were still trash. He told the goblins that the great shaman had delivered a divine message the recent racial enemies and their bipeds were of the same kind, and they needed to collect bipeds as curse materials. The goblin responded that being used as material for the great shaman's curse was a blessing for the sacrifices, and that the great ancestor would surely accept it. The goblin then instructed others to send the two captives with Fang. Realizing he wasn't going to be killed, the first boy thanked Lin. Mia thought that Lin had saved them. Lin told the goblin that the two captives needed some preliminary processing. The noisy one was clearly of low quality, so they should bleed him first, bury him for seven days, and provide him with additional food to keep him from dying. The goblin agreed to handle the bipeds properly. Lin thought it was time to get down to business. He told the goblin he was there for another purpose, and asked if the goblin had heard the slander against the great shaman from the outsider earlier. He requested the goblin's opinion on how to deal with the outsider. The goblin replied that the despicable outsider had insulted the great shaman and should be made to confess his sins before the great ancestor. As night fell and Lin rested inside a tent, Mia stood guard as Lin had instructed. If any noble arrived, she was to inform him immediately. 
Lin was seated with the goblins, reassuring them not to be nervous and clarifying that he was not the kind of forest goblin they might expect. He explained that the reason he had captured the Nameless One was not due to personal opposition, but because he had to follow the great shaman's orders, and that the old fool had lost his mind. The goblin told Lin that he couldn't say the great shaman didn't represent the will of the great ancestor, and that the actions taken were for their own good. Lin thought that gaining the support of the goblin warriors was not easy at all, and he was glad he had come prepared with the loudspeaker. He remarked that every time he gazed at the artifact, inherited from the great nameless one, he was reminded of him and the heroic sacrifice he made. Lin recalled the struggles of the lower forest goblins, while the nobles indulged in pleasure. The tribe was truly sick and beyond cruel. The loudspeaker had its effect, as the goblins began to agree with the great nameless one. One goblin asked what if they knew the tribe was sick. The great nameless one had ended up imprisoned in a rotten cell, and even Fang couldn't defy the orders of the great shaman. As an ordinary warrior, the goblin felt even more powerless. Another goblin said they couldn't change the tribe, so there was no hope. Lin disagreed, stating that it wasn't hopeless. A goblin asked why he thought so. Lin recounted a small story the Nameless One had shared with him, which he believed had important lessons for them. He asked them to imagine a huge death curse magic circle, flawless and nearly indestructible. The goblin wondered if such a circle sounded terrifying. Lin continued, explaining that inside the magic circle, many of their kin were sleeping soon to be drained of their life force and turned into withered corpses. However, they had been put under a sleep spell, so even if they were sacrificed, they wouldn't feel the sorrow of death. At that moment, if a forest goblin appeared outside the magic circle and shouted loudly enough, he might wake up a few of his kin and give them a chance to save themselves, though the chances of success were slim. If they failed, those he awakened would have to endure the agony of being drained of their life force. Lin continued, asking what they would do if they encountered a similar situation as described in the story. One goblin suggested waking them up, though he acknowledged that failure to save them might only increase their suffering. A second goblin proposed giving it a try, emphasizing that there was at least some hope. A third wondered what would happen if they failed, fearing the magic might drain all their life force. The first goblin asked Lin what the forest goblin in the story had done. Lin explained that the forest goblin outside the magic circle had broken into the circle itself. Instead of just shouting from outside, the goblin chose to share their fate and personally woke up each of his kin. Through the combined efforts of all the forest goblins, they managed to destroy the death curse magic circle. Shocked, the goblins asked if this was really possible. Lin responded that the nameless one had told him this story was based on a true event from a great race in a distant land. The message was simple no matter how unlikely something seemed. If they didn't try, it would be impossible. As long as they tried, there was hope. The Nameless One was the forest goblin who had willingly walked into the magic circle to awaken his kin. Lin swore by the sacred artifact to carry on his will and awaken others. He asked if they were willing to follow him. The goblins agreed, moved by the promise of comradeship. Lin declared that since they aimed to eliminate exploitation and oppression, the title Big One would no longer be used. Just like in that distant land, they would be equals and comrades. Hearing the term comrades made the goblins emotional. On the 38th day, Lin took his leave, thinking that with the loudspeaker's help, he had turned most of the goblin warriors and even lower-class civilian forest goblins into comrades. Now they needed an opportunity to start a rebellion. Some female goblins approached Lin, expressing concern that he had made a grave mistake by ordering them not to visit the Great Nameless One, which was considered an unforgivable crime. Lin asked for an explanation, pondering why such prompts seemed to take pleasure in others' misfortunes. Another goblin suggested that Fang might have had his reasons and might have been forced by the great shaman. Lin realized that this was the goblin who had captured himself. The second lady goblin confirmed that Fang was not the kind of forest goblin they had been led to believe. Lin said it wasn't the right place to discuss this matter further and suggested they move elsewhere. He reflected that his original plan had been to start with the female forest goblins to create an opportunity. And now the timing was just right. Using his charm skill, he convinced the women that he had no other choice. The Lady Goblin and her daughter were deeply moved by Lin's words. The daughter expressed her belief that Lin genuinely wanted to protect the Nameless One, but was being forced by the Great Shaman, which she found tragic. Lin explained that after careful consideration, he believed there was only one way to rescue the Nameless One. The Lady Goblin asked what that way was. Lin replied that the Great Shaman had ordered the capture of the Nameless One due to false rumors and slander spread by the male forest goblin nobles, leading to a misjudgment. To rescue the Nameless One, 
they needed to make the great shaman realize his mistake. The lady goblin agreed that the great shaman's judgment was flawed. The daughter asked how they would inform the great shaman of this error. Lin suggested that they should use the ancestral war drum to speak up for the nameless one in front of all the forest goblins in the tribe. The lady goblin worried about potential trouble from the despicable male goblins when they spoke up. Lin assured her that he would handle the nobles and swore by the sacred artifact inherited from the nameless one that he would save them. The daughter thanked Lin and agreed to work together to rescue the nameless one. After making this promise, Lin visited the male forest goblin noble, not to persuade, but to inform. The goblin noble asked Lin what he had to say. Lin explained that the spineless nobles were plotting to rescue the nameless one, who advocated for the common people and collaborated with outside enemies to topple the great shaman. Lin swore by the trophy he had taken from the nameless one that he was speaking the truth. Another goblin thanked Lin for his early warning, which had allowed them to prepare and suppress any immediate threats. On the 39th day, the lady goblins rang the ancestral war drum, declaring that the great shaman had been deceived by traitors and that the nameless one was innocent. They demanded his release and called for justice. Lin, hidden in the bushes with a goblin, observed the scene. The goblin suggested they go and support the lady goblins, noting their efforts to save the nameless one. Lin replied that their goal was to rescue people and eliminate exploitation, not to engage in internal conflict. He hoped that by shouting and appealing, they could persuade the nobles. If the nobles showed up, it might appear as though they were trying to use violence to force their surrender, potentially leading to fierce resistance and internal conflict, which would be counterproductive. The goblin agreed, acknowledging Lin's strategic thinking. However, a leader goblin arrived, shouting for the disturbance to stop. He declared that ringing the drum without permission was a serious crime, and questioning the great shaman was an even graver offense. He commanded the guards to arrest the lady goblins. The lady goblins were bewildered and questioned why this was happening, especially since Fang had promised to help them persuade the nobles. The goblin leader believed that by dealing with the troublemakers, they could subdue the lower class and prevent further unrest. As the guards captured the lady goblins, one of them argued that as descendants of the great ancestors, they had the right to ring the ancestral war drum. Another lady goblin, whose father had been a close aide to the previous great shaman, demanded to see the great shaman himself. Lin's comrade goblin asked how things had escalated to this point. Lin admitted it was his fault for underestimating the greed of the exploiters. He explained that the nobles had no intention of engaging in a meaningful conversation for the good of the tribe. Lin, along with his goblin ally and Mia, entered the scene and demanded the release of the Lady Goblins. Seeing Fang come to their aid, the Lady Goblins were overjoyed. Lin then shouted at the goblins, expressing his disappointment at their deceit. He accused them of pretending to agree with the pleas for justice while setting a trap to imprison their comrades under false charges. The noble Lady Goblin, glaring at the male goblin who had come to arrest them, accused him of being deceitful. The male goblin, however, asked them to hear his explanation. Lin instructed Mia to shoot. Without hesitation, Mia loosed an arrow aimed at the male goblin, intending to kill. Lin turned to his comrades, announcing that reasoning with these corrupt goblins was futile. They had been tricked, and there was no more room for negotiation. He commanded them to follow him as they stormed the prison to rescue the nameless one. With determination, they began moving towards the prison. Lin's thoughts raced with the realization that the fire of mutiny had been ignited. Now, he was eager to see how the great shaman would respond to the growing unrest. They arrived in front of the great shaman's area and loudly protested, demanding the release of the nameless one, an end to the exploitation, and justice for all. An arrow was fired at Lin, but one of his comrade goblins quickly pulled him out of the way, saving him from harm. The guards arrived, warning them to stop or face death without mercy if they advanced any further. The noble lady goblin noticed Fang among the guards and expressed surprise that he had returned from his mission to search for their racial enemies. She questioned why he was back now. Lin saw this as an opportunity. Despite Fang's power, Lin knew that if he could provoke internal conflict among the forest goblins, it would be advantageous. Maintaining the morale of his supporters was crucial. Using the loudspeaker, Lin addressed the gathered goblins. He challenged the idea of Fang leading the elite cavalry to block their path, suggesting that if the will to resist, awakened by the nameless one, was strong enough, they would never retreat. His words stirred the crowd and the goblins rallied, refusing to give up their fight. The atmosphere was charged with defiance and determination, as Lin and his followers prepared to face the impending confrontation. At the top of the tower, the great shaman was informed of a dire situation. A goblin reported that Fang, along with forest goblins bewitched by the nameless one, had raided the prison. Despite Fang's efforts to suppress the rebellion with his own troops, 
the number of bewitched goblins was overwhelming, making it difficult to control the situation. A second goblin, visibly shocked, asked if the rebels were indeed bewitched. The third goblin, in disbelief, questioned how Fang, the great shaman's most trusted ally, could betray them. The great shaman, growing impatient, grabbed the collar of the forest goblin who had brought the news. The forest goblin, trembling, insisted that he was telling the truth. The great shaman ordered the shaman beside him to release the forest goblin and urged him to answer honestly. He noted that while many peasants might be deceived, they were generally powerless. So it was troubling that Fang had not managed to suppress the riot. The forest goblin explained that, in addition to the lower-class peasants, Fang was contending with middle-class warriors and several nobles who had also joined the uprising. Fury erupted in the shaman. He denounced those who had betrayed their noble blood, lamenting that such folly had led to this chaos. Another goblin pointed out that although they could summon new peasants through the abyss gate, losing warriors and nobles, who were the foundation of their tribe, would severely weaken their strength. The great shaman ordered the immediate use of the ancestral totem to preserve as much of the tribe's strength as possible, leaving the rest to be decided later. He threw a small object to the wood shaman who caught it and expressed his gratitude. Meanwhile, a warrior observing the turmoil from a hill through a telescope reported the situation to Lu via walkie-talkie. The warrior conveyed that the forest goblins were in disarray, presenting a perfect opportunity for a full assault. As the goblins clashed among themselves, the strategy was set. The first squad was to keep firing arrows, the second squad would chase down any retreating rebels, and the third squad was to follow closely to prevent any breakthroughs in their defense. The battle was set to intensify, with both sides bracing for the ensuing conflict. Lin's goblins charged forward, their determination palpable. Originally, Lin had planned only to incite internal conflict among the forest goblins to exhaust their forces. However, their combined combat strength had proven unexpectedly potent, even allowing them to gain an edge against the elite cavalry. Lin wondered if this newfound strength might be enough to directly challenge the great shaman and possibly even overthrow him. As the battle raged, the wood shaman arrived, announcing that the ancestral totem had descended. He called for an immediate halt to the fighting. Lin, puzzled by the sudden cessation of hostilities, wondered why the forest goblins had stopped moving. The wood shaman declared that the ancestral totem represented the great ancestors and that he would now proclaim a divine oracle. Lin noted that the Wood Shaman was likely equipped with enhanced artifacts, which suggested a significant power shift. The Shaman explained that the Great Shaman, guided by the Divine Oracle, had already judged the Nameless One to be innocent. The first goblins expressed their relief and joy, believing that the Great Ancestors had indeed protected the Nameless One. Lin recognized the potential setback this presented. If the Divine Oracle's proclamation undermined their motivation, Lin's efforts could become futile. The Wood Shaman further claimed that the Great Ancestors never made mistakes and that the previous disturbances had been an act of irreverence. Fortunately, the Great Shaman had shown mercy and forgave everyone involved, instructing them to return home. Lin observed that the Forest Goblin's deep respect for the Great Shaman made it difficult for them to question his decisions. The respect they held was so ingrained that any challenge to it seemed futile. Lin's direct contradiction of the Divine Oracle would likely backfire. Lin instructed his comrades to hold off on leaving and wait to see the Nameless One released. He wanted to personally escort the Nameless One out and celebrate his exoneration. One of the goblins warned Lin not to push his luck, reminding him that the great shaman had already forgiven everyone and celebrating a so-called criminal was unwise. Lin stopped and questioned why, if the great shaman had declared the Nameless One innocent, the wood shaman still referred to him as a criminal. The wood shaman responded that Fang's request had not been unreasonable and that he had acted on behalf of the great shaman. Lin was taken into a building where the wood shaman expressed surprise at Fang's actions, admitting that he had previously thought of Fang as an ambitionless, pleasure-seeking slacker. However, Fang's unexpected resolve had caught him off guard. As Lin considered his next move, the uncertainty of the situation left him grappling with how to proceed, weighing the challenges of dealing with a potentially undermined morale and the complex dynamics of forest goblin politics. Lin wondered what the wood shaman was babbling about. The wood shaman revealed that Lin usually acted like a laid-back loafer who only cared about having a good time, leaving the great shaman completely unguarded against him. In reality, however, Lin had always been ambitious, waiting for the right moment. When Fang saw the peasants rebel, he seized the opportunity to build momentum and overthrow the great shaman to control the entire tribe. Fang came close to succeeding, but his schemes were easily thwarted by the great shaman, who instead gained even more trust. Lin thought that they believed he was plotting a coup, but it was such a limited perspective. As they headed inside, Lin considered that if they started a battle there, 
they wouldn't have to worry about alerting the forest goblins outside. The wood shaman informed Lin that because of his rebellion, the wood shaman's power had increased significantly and advised him to leave the Thunder Tribe quickly, warning that the great shaman wouldn't spare him. Lin remarked that the wood shaman seemed to enjoy giving advice, and coincidentally, Lin was also a big fan of sharing his wisdom with others. Just then, Chirp attacked the wood shaman. Remaining calm, Lin continued that his words of wisdom were only for the departed, advising them to take it slow on the road to the underworld, where they might be able to accompany the best shaman. As he saw Chirp about to eat a pendant, he stopped her, saying that he had other plans for it and that she wouldn't be eating it. Outside, others wondered why Fang hadn't come with the Nameless One and eagerly awaited meeting the Nameless One. They thought the Wood Shaman had secretly revealed that after the root was quelled, the peasants would have to provide more food and perform more hard labor. The entire purpose of the mud-legged peasants' existence was to support the upper-class forest goblins. As for the useless nobles, since they sided with the peasants, the Great Shaman decided to remove them to the peasants as well, meaning that even high-ranking noblewomen would have to serve them obediently. A goblin noticed someone coming out. Another thought it best to finish the celebration quickly and then send the peasants home, so the riot could be considered over and they could settle accounts later. Lin was with the injured goblin, and others wondered what had happened inside the prison and what was holding Fang. Lin explained that the Nameless One was dead, having been tortured brutally by the shaman and suffered from the tribe's injustice. They were all shocked by this revelation. One goblin expressed disbelief, noting that aside from Fang, no Iron Root leader had interrogated the Nameless One and asked where the Wood Shaman was and why he hadn't come out. It was clear from the start that the Great Shaman never intended to let the Nameless One live, as the noble system set up by the Great Shaman represented the greatest injustice to the entire tribe. Lin thought it was clear they were not oblivious to such an obvious problem and swore to their great ancestors that he would avenge the Nameless One's comrade, overthrow the Great Shaman, and eliminate injustice. He realized that they were too enraged by the harsh reality to listen to any explanations, so he urged them to overthrow the great shaman, destroy the nobles, and avenge the nameless one. He called for the death of those who defended exploitation and injustice, using their blood to honor their comrades. As the goblins attacked the guards, one of them called for a stop, sensing something was wrong. Lin thought that a dead forest goblin was more useful than a living one in this situation. Fueled by rage, the goblins began fighting each other and killing indiscriminately, with the ordinary goblins proving weak against the guards. Lin and his team approached the temple. The guards warned that it was a sacred place where souls rested beside the great ancestor after death and insisted they must not allow the peasants to charge the high ground. Lin told his comrades that the temple where the great shaman resided was just ahead and dawn was approaching. Lin thought that although the forest goblin troops led by the nobles were well-equipped and had high morale, it would be impossible to break into the temple. He realized that he needed to seize the opportunity to destroy the portal and complete the main quest. As they charged into the temple, Lin spotted a gap in the battle, which would be his chance. He observed a forest goblin slashing at a guard with a sword, only to see it break. The goblin was confused, and then the guard goblin began to glow. Lin checked the guard's profile and realized it was a result of secret arts enhancement. Clearly the shaman had made his move. The great shaman appeared, telling Fang that if he surrendered obediently, he could be forgiven as he had watched Fang grow. Lin asked what would happen to his companions if Fang surrendered. The Great Shaman retorted that Fang had no right to negotiate with the Great Shaman. His subordinates were merely peasants who could not withstand the Temple Guard's assault and would soon be skewered one by one as punishment for their sins. Allowing Fang to surrender was the greatest mercy the Great Shaman could offer, and if Fang did not accept it, he would die alongside the peasants. A goblin told Lin that they were no match for the Shaman's power and advised him not to worry about them. He said that if Lin survived, it would be enough. The shaman, confident that Lin was not as foolish as the forest goblins who worshipped him, mentioned that Lin did not want to be buried with the peasants and should return to face the shaman. Lin remarked that, to the shaman, all goblins were merely lowly ants, expendable and easily sacrificed. He questioned whether what the shaman was saying even made sense. The other goblins were shocked to hear this. Lin used a loudspeaker to declare that, despite their differences, all goblins were like comrades, friends, and fellow warriors, sharing the same ideals and walking the same path to eliminate injustice in the tribe. He believed it was a critical moment and that they needed to boost morale once more and fight. Lin told the Great Shaman that this would be the day either he or the Great Shaman would perish, with no third option. He told his comrades that the blood of the Nameless One must not be shed in vain and that if they were shattered into pieces, they must fall forward on the path. 
the goblins agreed with this sentiment. The great shaman dismissed Fang as foolish, stating that a bunch of peasants were not capable of overturning the world. A goblin arrived, reporting that something terrible had happened, a large army of bipeds was attacking, and the frontline troops couldn't hold them off. He asked the great shaman to send reinforcements. The shaman replied that it would be impossible, and that the captured bipeds were so weak they couldn't even best the peasants of their tribe. Another shaman agreed, noting that the front line was guarded by General Bonecrusher's army and questioning how it could be breached by a group of weak bipeds. The injured goblin countered that the bipeds they were facing were completely different from what they had encountered before. They were equipped with fine armor and their weapons could hardly be harmed. Additionally, their leader employed bizarre tactics that completely neutralized their simultaneous attacks. The goblins were shocked and recognized these bipeds as their racial foes, believing they must be the very enemies prophesied by the divine oracle. A forest goblin wondered how it could be that the enemy of their race was not just one individual, but an entire army. Lin thought about how he had been labeled the enemy of the race, reflecting on how the ancient god warriors knew how to seize the moment. Lu, his kindred spider, proved to be exceptionally capable. The injured goblin pleaded with the great shaman to send reinforcements quickly to halt the advancing army, or General Bonecrusher would perish. Lin urged the great shaman to focus on the urgent task of repelling this powerful enemy, and offered to lead his followers to the front line to fight, suggesting that the great shaman should also send his main forces to support Lin's squad. Lin hoped that by drawing all the great shaman's troops away, he could later return and carry out his plan for decapitation. The great shaman, observing Fang's attempts to rally the peasants for a rebellion, while now pretending to consider the bigger picture, was skeptical. A guard goblin noted that the traitor's logic made sense, and that they should prioritize the larger threat. The great shaman concluded that Fang must be eliminated, and declared that the enemy of their race must be eradicated. Although Fang led a rebellion and the peasants had killed many nobles, in the face of their racial enemy, they were all considered compatriots. The shaman announced, witnessed by the great ancestor, a new law for the tribe if a lowly peasant killed an enemy of their race on the battlefield, they would be granted noble status. The two other nobles were intrigued by the prospect of becoming nobles themselves, while another wondered if the great shaman was truly not going to hold them accountable for the rebellion. Lin noted that the great shaman's decisive move and tactic of dividing interests were quite skillful. A shaman questioned why the peasants, incited by Fang, should be pardoned and elevated to noble status. The great shaman replied that the law was not unconditional, and that for it to take effect, he must engage in a sacred duel with Lin to atone for all the rebels' sins. A goblin suspected that the great shaman didn't genuinely intend to forgive the peasants, but rather sought to eliminate Fang under the guise of a sacred duel. Once Fang was dead, dealing with the remaining peasants would be easy. The great shaman asked Lin if he dared to accept the duel. Lin realized that the old man believed Fang's combat strength was far inferior to his own and was looking for a legitimate reason to silence him. Moreover, by offering the bait that even peasants could become nobles, the great shaman had managed to sow doubt among some of Lin's forest goblins. Lin saw this as an opportunity that had come to him unexpectedly, and he decided to accept the challenge. The other goblins were shocked and urged Lin not to agree to the great shaman's terms. A lady goblin pointed out that the great shaman was aware of Lin's weak combat power and intended to use the duel as an excuse to kill him. Lin responded that the most crucial task now was to confront the enemy of their race. He explained that if he refused the duel, the great shaman would not agree to join forces to defend the tribe. Lin urged them not to forget that their fight was against exploitation and for the betterment of the tribe. He said that if his death could bring safety to the tribe and ensure fair treatment for his comrades, he would die without regret. He added that once he was gone, they need not remember him, as long as they remembered their ideals and the reason for their fight. The forest goblins were deeply moved. One hoped for Fang's swift demise but slapped himself and pleaded with Lin not to go. A guard, also emotional, expressed admiration for Lin's selflessness and greatness, acknowledging that despite being the enemy, Lin was deserving of respect. With Lin's acceptance of the great shaman's duel, the internal strife within the Thunder Tribe came to an end. The scene shifts to the battlefield, where the first goblins are being slain by the warriors. As the guard goblins arrive, they are immediately attacked by Lei's hammer. He mocks them, saying their little tricks may work on minions, but are useless against a mini-boss that triggers hunting quests. Min, already having immobilized the target, tells Lei to hurry up and attack. Lei responds that he didn't need to be told. He was already aware. The guard goblin laments that if they had a shaman with them and some secret arts to enhance their strength, they wouldn't be in this predicament. Lei leaps into action, eager to demonstrate his strength. The scene then shifts to Lu's side of the battle. 
Lu declares that once they eliminate the forest goblins, they can attack the tribes, and he is determined to win the main quest. The location for the goblin sacred duel is the ancestral spirit area, where Lin and the great shaman are preparing for battle. The great shaman acknowledges Lin's unique method of inciting peasants to revolt and seize power, which took him by surprise. However, the great shaman believes that peasants are inherently foolish, easily swayed by minor benefits, and incapable of uniting. Lin dismisses the great shaman's taunts, considering such trash talk a tradition before a duel. Mia, who is with Lin, is currently acting as a slave, but Lin assures her that she won't need to act now. He even provides her with an item that will enhance his abilities as well. The great shaman comments on the centaur with a slave collar, noting that such a creature would have no will of its own, and questions whether Fang has lost his mind. Just then, an arrow flies toward the great shaman, but he deflects it with a shield, wondering if it's a special archery technique from the centaur. Despite this, he notices that the centaur retains her original consciousness. Lin instructs Mia not to hold back and to use the arrows he prepared for her with all her might. She begins shooting the arrows at the great shaman, who skillfully dodges them. Lin uses battle memory recall to create a powerful blast, which shocks the great shaman. Lin mentions that he had specifically arranged for his assistant to exchange points for explosive arrows, and their effectiveness is proving to be impressive. The great shaman admits that he underestimated Lin. The great shaman was taken aback by Lin's true nature, realizing that his playful and indulgent demeanor was merely a facade, hiding his ambitious and cunning side. The shaman then commands his centaur mount to shoot an arrow, taunting Lin by questioning whether he believes restoring the centaur slave's combat skills and memories would allow them to defeat him. Lin quickly assesses the situation and recognizes that things are more complex than anticipated. The great shaman begins to glow, proclaiming that Lin's centaur slave could never match his own mount, and the duel would soon be decided. Lin, while seemingly nonchalant, is covertly preparing for his next move. He is secretly gathering power while interfering with the language and thinks about his advanced preparations. Explosive arrows bought with five points per set, each set containing ten arrows, and he still has nine left. Lin decides to use these to his advantage. He asks Mia to use the explosive arrows on the centaur. Mia hesitates, reluctant to target her own kind. Lin reminds her of their promise to seek revenge, stressing that sacrifices must be made, and even though the centaur is one of their kind, it is now their enemy. Lin reflects that while Chirp follows his orders without question, Mia still harbors doubts. Reluctantly, Mia complies and fires the explosive arrows. The arrows hit their mark, creating a powerful blast. Mia is astonished by the effect. The great shaman reveals that his mount was originally the chieftain of the centaur tribe and the best archer among them. Lin instructs Mia to employ tactic B. Mia agrees, lifting Lin in her hands to rush ahead. The great shaman mocks Lin, suggesting that merging with Mia will not help him and that they won't even get close to his mount. As the shaman orders his centaur to target Lin, Lin notes that it's as expected. His own safety is secured, and Mia is the target. The great shaman insists that even if Lin begs for mercy now, it will be too late. He commands the centaur to attack Lin, confident in his impending victory. Lin braces himself, ready to face the oncoming assault and execute his strategy. Lin raises his shield to block the incoming attack and presses forward with Mia. The great shaman questions when Fang learned the secret technique that allowed him to use such powerful arrows. Lin tells Mia that this is their opportunity and directs her to shoot several arrows simultaneously at the great shaman. The arrows create a massive explosion, causing significant injuries to the shaman. Despite the damage, the great shaman believes Fang's special arrows are exhausted and that he cannot defeat him now. As the smoke clears, the great shaman sees Chirp approaching, causing him to wonder where this unexpected monster came from and whether it's another one of Fang's tricks. Mia, confused and concerned, asks Lin what is happening. Lin recognizes that the situation is more complex than anticipated. The disparity between Chirp's strength and the Great Shaman's is vast, and even superior tactics might not be enough to bridge the gap. The Great Shaman declares that it is futile to continue, stating that his physical strength has been constantly enhanced by his secret technique, making it impossible for such a weak attack to harm him. He channels his ultimate secret art, completing the summoning of the Thunder Shaman. With the spirit power of the Great Ancestor blessing him, he becomes invincible. The Great Shaman then forces Chirp to retreat, demonstrating the overwhelming power he now wields. Lin realizes that the battle has become even more difficult and that they need to rethink their strategy to overcome the Great Shaman's newfound invincibility. Chirp used her spiderweb to get to safety. The Great Shaman told her that she could attack with all her might and he would show her the true blessings of the Great Ancestors. She looked at Lin, 
who shook his head in denial. He thought that, although it was just a personal guess and not certain, it seemed that each instance task arranged by the ancient gods had an instance boss. The instance boss not only set the attributes, but also possessed unique leader-level skills. Generally speaking, leader-level skills gave the instance boss a significant advantage in battle, but they also came with certain costs or major weaknesses. The great shaman was clearly the instance boss, and his leader-level skill was Thunder Shaman Summoning. If they could find the weakness of this leader-level skill, they might be able to defeat him with minimal cost. The great shaman said it was too late to be afraid now. He was going to torture the monster Lin controlled right in front of him, then execute him and offer every inch of his flesh to the great ancestors. He would start with that arrogant monster who had just pointed a blade at him. Mia shot a lot of arrows, but they were all broken by the energy surrounding the great shaman. As Chirp rushed to attack, he used his powers to make her fall back with injuries. He told them that it was all useless and their attacks were futile against him. Then he used his power to release a blast towards them. Chirp barely managed to block it. Mia was injured by the blast and thought she was going to die. Lin then stepped in to use his shield to block the attack. The great shaman said that the so-called power was nothing before him, and even if they saved it now, they would be slaughtered by him in the end. He asked if Lin was too scared to say anything now. Lin asked the great shaman if he had not moved even with his spirit power and all his tricks, and whether neither he nor his creatures had wavered. The great shaman asked if Lin was trying to say that he was a warrior and wanted to save face before he died. Lin replied that he was stating a fact. Even though the great shaman's leader skills were incredibly powerful, Lin had known about them for a long time. The great shaman was shocked that Lin already knew about his ultimate skill. He declared it impossible, asserting that he had been cautious all his life and everyone who knew about that power had been killed. Lin commented that it was as expected from a forest goblin with a twelve mentality and finally, the great shaman realized the truth. Chirp then attacked the great shaman, who wondered how she dared to use a finishing move against him. He unleashed the mercy of the goddess of desire attack and noted that the power surge was approaching the strength he had gained from the spirit essence. He recognized that the creature's finishing move was explosive, channeling everything into a single strike, and concluded that if he could block it, it would be over. He told Chirp that the ancestor's blessings wouldn't be easily broken, and even if Lin's monster used all its strength, it couldn't breach his defenses. Lin responded that, as expected, the moment of narrow escape was when one might most likely let their guard down. Lin thought that the Spider Matriarch's leader skill, Mercy of the Goddess of Desire, was an explosive move that channeled all the body's strength into one strike. Detailed information from the attribute panel showed that the power of this move was based on the sum of strength and agility. Judging from previous trials, Lin surmised that the Great Shaman, bolstered by a leader-level secret technique, would be able to narrowly deflect the attack if he defended with all his might. Lin used the morale boost and urged Chirp to finish the attack. As Chirp launched her assault, the great shaman was stunned, finding it impossible to handle. Chirp created a massive blast directed at the great shaman. Lin noted that, as calculated, he had caught the great shaman off guard for a moment, boosted his attributes with the morale boost, and instantly enhanced the power of the spider matriarch's leader skill. Breaking through the Great Shaman's defenses in one strike was Lin's only vow to win. Chirp was also tired and injured from the attack. Lin wondered why he felt like he was freeloading, but he knew it wasn't the time for such thoughts. The priority was to loot the corpse for spoils. As he examined the Great Shaman's body, he noted it was clearly cut in two, yet it was divided into many pieces. He questioned whether the Spider Matriarch's leader skill was really that bizarre. Checking the panel, he saw that there was equipment that enhanced attributes, and realized he couldn't afford to miss it. He then asked Chirp if she was all right and reassured her that she didn't have to push herself. While searching, he found another fang pendant. Could it be that all the goblin enhancement gear was just pendants? Seeing Chirp approach, he asked if she wanted him to put the pendant on her. She smiled, and he helped her put it on, thinking there was no need for the spider matriarch to remind him. The best gear was naturally meant for her. He noticed Chirp's agility increased by one point, and wondered if the great shaman's pendant was just more advanced in appearance, but with the same effect as a common one. When Chirp was about to eat the first pendant, he tried to stop her. However, she consumed it. Lin thought, setting aside the prompt, that the spider matriarch's agility attribute hadn't changed at all. Since she was currently gnawing on the great shaman's pendant, technically, it wasn't counted as equipping it. In other words, the great shaman's pendant might actually increase agility by two points, but that enhancement couldn't stack with a pendant that increased agility by one point. He told Chirp that since she liked it so much, she could treat it as a snack. 
Lin reasoned that since attribute enhancements from equipment couldn't stack, the replaced gear wasn't very useful. Additionally, the ancient gods hadn't enabled an equipment recycling feature, and monster gear couldn't be sold to players. Thus, using it to maintain the spider matriarch's goodwill was fine. He noticed in Chirp's profile that there was an XX in her power, and wondered if it was something unspeakable. However, judging from the prompt, the changes in the spider matriarch seemed beneficial for him, so he decided not to worry about any trouble. Then Mia called Lin, and he wondered if something had happened to her. She was very emotional, crying over the death of the centaur, and pleaded with Lin to save him. Lin realized that the centaur had only regained normal combat skills, but not consciousness. He had been controlled by the great shaman's secret technique to reenact battle memories. Lin apologized to Mia, explaining that there was no way to save the centaur. After being fitted with the cursed slave collar, his soul was already dead. Mia began to cry. Lin thought that both Chirp and Mia were injured, but still capable of fighting, so there was no need to rush. He told Mia that they had more important matters to attend to, and that they needed to destroy the altar at the center of the temple. As long as the altar existed, forest goblins would continue invading from another world, and disasters like the one that befell the centaur tribe would persist. Mia agreed, acknowledging that it was their responsibility. Lin admired her, noting that although her emotions were deep, she didn't let them hinder her actions in critical moments. Her simple-mindedness and kind heart made her quite suitable for a pact. The scene shifted to the goblin's army, where a general was being informed about the battle. The general instructed not to worry, advising that their peasants should die first to weaken the enemy before they would strike. A first goblin warned against recklessness, recalling Fang's reminder to fight for the tribe but not to be used by these exploiters. A female goblin suggested pulling back slightly and charging together as usual. Another goblin, whose eyes were red with anger, dismissed Fang's advice and claimed that they were fools. He argued that this was their chance to claim the heads of the bipeds and become new nobles, and they wouldn't give that up. He urged them not to let their chance to become upper nobles slip away, and despite any objections, he was going to lead the charge, insisting they kill the bipeds and become great nobles. Lin, along with Mia and Chirp, was making his way upstairs, fighting through the goblins. He wondered who would have thought that, in a battle where the tribe's existence was at stake, they still kept temple guards. This suggested that there was something of great importance in the temple. Lu addressed the warriors, telling them that a head was the source of the forest goblins. He urged them to break through the goblin troops blocking their path, assuring them that completing this main quest, set by the ancient god, would be a victory for humanity. Each warrior was seasoned by battles filled with blood and sweat, and the battlefield was no longer unfamiliar to them. Now, with equipment blessed by the ancient god, they had entered the realm of the extraordinary. Jing admired Lu's inspiring speech, thinking that if an ancient god warrior originally had a combat power of five points, that speech would have at least doubled it to ten points. Lu continued, stating that for the decisive battle of the day, they had made ample preparations and had the blessings of heaven, favorable terrain, and unity among humans on their side. The advantage was theirs. As the goblins began their attack, Lu told them that the battle would take place there and urged them to charge. The warriors rushed into battle with the goblins. Meanwhile, as Lin reached the top of the temple, he found himself caught in a shield. He noted that they hadn't triggered any shield mechanisms along the way, suggesting there were no traps, but they still needed to destroy it. Suddenly, he saw a tombstone glowing and releasing a powerful energy that infused the goblins who were battling the warriors. The goblins felt their strength increase as if the great ancestors were protecting them. A warrior remarked that the forest goblins had suddenly grown stronger. Lu explained that the goblins' combat power had indeed increased. He realized that if they didn't take action, even if they won the battle, they would suffer heavy losses and end up with no one left to manipulate later. He announced that command would be transferred to Zheng and that the battle must not be lost. Lu would lead the charge from now on. Someone asked if Lu was trying to sacrifice himself. Lu urged everyone to follow him to eliminate the goblins. The scene shifted back to Lin who thought that although he wasn't sure what the black aura was or what it did, it clearly didn't bode well. Regardless, his focus remained on destroying the altar to claim the main quest reward and then get out. He asked Chirp to smash the altar. As she rushed to attack it, the altar cracked, emitting a powerful aura towards Lin. Lin realized that the black aura was indeed harmful and that the energy required to block it with the shield was alarmingly high. He noticed that neither Mia nor Chirp had any shield protection, and in such a dense black mist, they were potentially in danger. To his surprise, Mia seemed to be affected by a foul odor, but Chirp appeared unaffected. 
Lin concluded that the aura was harmless to the monsters and might even be beneficial to them in some way. As the mist dissipated, Chirp and Mia approached Lin, asking if they could help Chirp. Lin reassured them not to worry, stating that Chirp would be fine. He reasoned that since the black aura could aid the monster's growth, there was no need to avoid it. However, although Mia's injuries were healed, she hadn't gained any benefit from the black aura. Lin checked Chirp's profile again and wondered what the X denoted. He vaguely remembered a prompt mentioning the creation of XX and wondered if they were related. Lin felt a strange sensation at the mark on his hand and realized that even without the prompt, he could sense that Chirp's condition was deteriorating and she could no longer absorb any more of the black aura. He instructed Chirp to completely destroy the altar and then they would leave. As Chirp attacked the altar, Lin asked Mia to assist as well. Seizing the opportunity, Chirp struck the altar, shattering it. On the battlefield, the goblins' strength returned to normal as their overstrength faded. Lu informed his warriors that the goblins would now be unable to defeat them, urging them to charge. A goblin noted that something was wrong and suggested retreating to avoid certain defeat. Lu checked the quest screen and announced to his warriors that they had completed the first phase of their mission. He instructed them to follow him into the village to finish the remaining tasks and claim their rewards. The warriors were elated by the news. In the temple, Lin confirmed that the Black Mist was indeed linked to the altar and would disappear once the altar was completely destroyed. With the main quest completed, it was time to assess individual contributions. Lin noted how quickly things had progressed and remarked that Lu's team was exceptionally strong. He speculated that they would soon advance to the Thunder Tribe, so he needed to retreat quickly. As Lu and his team ascended the temple, Lu reflected on their achievements. He had invested many points and even engaged in frontline combat to secure the highest rewards for the main quest. The team awaited confirmation of the quest's completion and the calculation of individual contributions. Lu was shocked and puzzled, questioning how the quest had been completed when he hadn't yet found the twisted route. He wondered if someone had taken advantage of the battle with the first goblin army, sneaking into the village while its defenses were down, and cut down the twisted route. Other warriors expressed outrage, saying that whoever did this deserved a terrible fate and was effectively an enemy of all humanity. Lei, too, was enraged, feeling that his bloody battles on the front line were undermined by someone else stealing his victory. Lu, seeing that his individual rank was two, realized that the main quest rewards were about to be distributed. He was dismayed that despite his extensive effort and planning to secure the most rewards, the outcome seemed to have been someone else's doing. He vowed to find out who was behind it and make them pay. Meanwhile, Lin discovered that he was at the top of the individual rankings, and would soon receive the rewards for completing the main storyline task. He reflected that the ancient god's judgment seemed fair, and was pleased that Chirp's boost had helped him secure the top reward, which was a significant return. Lin was awarded Agatha's level 1 combat check of the red rank, and wondered if this was the highest quality level. He was surprised by the ancient god's generosity. Mia, confused, couldn't clearly see what appeared in front of Lin. Lin gets that the main storyline chest had no location restrictions and could be opened at any time. It would unlock a red tier chest with a 90% chance of yielding gold tier gear and a 10% chance of red tier gear, with similar rules applying to other quality chests. Lin thought opening the ancient god's chest was as thrilling as drawing from a blind box. He felt fortunate to have drawn purple gear from a purple chest earlier, and since he could now open the chest outside, he was eager to see how lucky he could be.